just to get us started, um, we're I'm very pleased to have uh, Pardis Madavi, who's the Dean of Social Sciences at the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at Arizona State, uh, who will say a few words to get us started and hopefully orient us a bit to the rest of the afternoon. Um, so Pardis, thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, just can take off my mask so that our friends who are on the live stream can hear and see me. Um, thank you all for being here with us uh, today. Um, it's a great honor and pleasure to be able to join you, to welcome you um, for this important event. The work of the Center uh, for the Democracy is essential to the college overall. So I'm Dean of Social Sciences in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, but you know the work that um, Michael and his center are doing really resonates across not just the college, but across the university and then, of course, locally and transnationally as well. Um, you know, as we stand here in this moment of what many of us are calling a triple pandemic, right? We've got the viral pandemic of COVID, we've got a social pandemic of racism, and then we have a pand pandemic of uh, climate emergency. So we have these triple pandemics, these, these really pressing problems, and I think that um, centers uh, such as this one are very well positioned to intervene in all of the wicked problems that arise from the nexus of these. Um, the work that, that the center is doing sits at the intersections of policy, labor, democracy, um, questions that are really at the forefront as we think about the role of democratic institutions in shaping or in pushing and pulling these you know, bifurcated discourses around um, you know, the, the local versus the cosmopolitan, um, you know, combating xenophobic and populist movements. I think understanding labor, understanding the intersections of labor, work, democracy are essential. Um, I also say this as somebody who works in this space, my own work is located uh, solidly in, in, within this um, uh, discursive center. Um, I work on human trafficking and intimate labor. And so I see my work as really, really, really connected to the work that, that Michael and the center are doing um, and, and really truly interdisciplinary which is why I think the center fits so well here at ASU, because we are committed to interdisciplinarity. And if you look at the charter of ASU and our mission to be inclusive, to be accessible, and to have public impact, I can think of no center, at least under me, and I've got about 23 centers under me, um, that fulfills that mission more solidly than the Center for Work and Democracy. So I just want to thank you all for having me. Welcome. I think this is going to be a terrific conference. For those of you joining us virtually, welcome. So glad that you're here with us. Um, and uh, I will turn it back over to our very talented center director, Dr. Michael McQuarrie. Thanks again. Um, so uh, uh, I'm Michael McQuarrie. I'm the director of the Center for Working Democracy. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about the center um, as a way of orienting people to what we're doing today. Um, the core thesis of the Center for Working Democracy is that many of our current ills can be traced to marginalization of working people's voices on the job, in the public sphere, and in politics. This has happened both because of the way elite parties and the judiciary have ring fenced our political system to exclude regular people, and because the institutions that have historically helped amplify the voices of working people are in a state of decline or collapse. Even before recent attacks on political rights, policymaking was dominated by economic elites and organized interest groups, not voters. Combining exclusion with rapidly accelerating inequality, marginalization, and precarity, and you have a potent recipe for political extremism, uh, violence, and even the organization of major political parties around the necropolitics of deciding who can live and who should die, rather than a competition over how best to provide for all citizens. Workplace struggles have been one of the main levers for working people to use their collective power. Workplace organizing was arguably the lever for bringing down the Soviet empire between 1980 and 1989 in the form of the solidarity movement and the lever that made the South African apartheid, that made South African apartheid unsustainable. Um, in the United States, it produced the most economically inclusive period in US history. Unsurprisingly, it is this form of protest that became the proving ground for managing, channeling, and criminalizing protests and organizing that are tied to the media. But those techniques are now being used on protesters generally and even civil society organizations that advocate and organize for a more inclusive and equitable society. Viewed from another perspective, the United States has always had an uneasy tension between being a nominally democratic republic and a racial state. 
So while de facto citizens are managed, channeled, and even criminalized, slave descended Black people and indigenous populations have been the victims of systematic state and crime and violence, which was the basis for American state and economic development. Working people, increasingly people of color and women, are trapped between the violent methods of social control deployed on the marginalized and the institutional and bureaucratic methods of control that were developed to manage workers. I say all this in the introduction to this conference because you're going to hear about conflicts and protests that we might not intuitively define as labor struggles. Uh, but such um, taxonomic fine pointery is a habitual activity in both academia and movement spaces. But our democracy is in crisis, and indeed our civilization is heading for one. Zero sum thinking and oppression Olympics will make these catastrophic outcomes more likely. The principle of the center's work is that democracy is only possible if movements for justice, inclusion, and equality are broadly successful. And I believe that the union that is the primary funder and originator of this center has a similar idea. That union is United Healthcare Workers West, which is represented here by President David Reagan, who I believe is running this virtually. <laughs> Um, UHW's first priority is uh, naturally to solve the strategic <laughs> dilemma that confronts uh, the American labor movement and unions generally, uh, but it's also a union that acts as if it represents not just its members, but working people generally. This is evident not least in its support of the research we've been conducting in George Floyd Square, which was the epicenter of the uprising last summer, um, but also evident, for example, in UHW's support for the contested ballot, California ballot initiative. Uh, that would have made uh, gig workers employees and therefore covered by the National Labor Relations Act. So, um, an indigenous movement collective recently asserted that the future is a territory to be defended. And indeed, it is. If that defense is to be successful, it will require the work of various movements across a broad geographical and institutional terrain. But more than that, it will require the benefits of what Heather McGee calls solidarity dividends that come when movements act as though the success and flourishing of their own constituents can only come with the success and flourishing of others. The center is very interested in the labor movement and the dilemmas that confront today's unions, but it is also co-hosted a conference on the Greek, co-hosted a conference on the Green New Deal that was organized by Craig Calhoun and Ben Plown, a symposium on women and migrant labor that was organized by Mary Margaret Polo, um, and it is uh, involved in research on the George Floyd uprising now. And it does all of those things with that spirit in mind. Okay. So uh, one thing I want to say is that this was originally a working conference for the center, um, and um, we were nudged gently to make it a public conference as well. Um, so we are balancing this tension of needing to get work done at the same time as we are presenting a number of things. Um, but uh, with that in mind, I want to introduce a couple of people who are not presenting but are very important participants in this conference. Um, so uh, the first two people I want to introduce are Ashley and Will Tyner. Uh, Will is up here in the front row with the camera. Um, Will is a guest um, of ours who is joining us with Janelle Austin, who will be presenting. He and uh, Ashley are doing a documentary on Janelle Austin and her work in George Floyd Square. Uh, so that's why they're with us here today. They'll be with us all day. So introduce yourselves and make them feel welcome. Um, we have two other uh, filmmakers here as well, uh, Rochelle Shapiro and Kylie Kraskowskis, who are not actually in the room. I believe they're set up over there. Uh, but they'll be in and out today as well. Um, and we'll be looking at some of their work in about two minutes. Um, I also want to introduce um, uh, some of our new RAs who will also be kicking around. So I hope you will introduce them, uh, introduce yourself to them. Um, Jorge Hernandez, just raise your hand so people know who you are. Uh, Maria Esch, um, Muriel Herodo, um, Isaac Sundin, and Kira Ortloff. Um, and then there are a couple who weren't able to make it, but um, these will these are the people that will be helping make our projects happen over the coming year. Um, the other new people that we'll be hearing from, um, I'll introduce the other people uh, later on because they're actually presenting. Um, okay, and uh, let me just say a quick note of thanks to Jean Kolchak, who is the event coordinator at SSP. Thank you very much, Jean, for helping with all of this. I appreciate it. Um, all right. So with that introduction out of the way, I am going to start us off, and I am completely unprepared to give this talk because I've been talking about logistics all day. So we're going to see how this goes. Um, and I'm going to start leaning slightly on Kylie and Rochelle's work. Um, uh, uh, right, okay. 
So uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is the research we're doing in Jordan's Red Square, and I'm one of two people that will be talking about that today. Um, Janelle Austin, who is uh, one of the leaders in George Floyd Square. She's the co-founder of the George Floyd Global Memorial. Um, and we are hoping will be joining us at ASU uh, for a fair amount of the coming year. We'll be also be talking about GFS um, this afternoon. And I think given that she's here, I'm going to be framing my discussion uh, mostly around giving an overall picture of GFS so that people are familiar with what she's going to be talking about a little bit later this afternoon. Um, but one thing that we did uh, last fall is um, George Floyd Square uh, was an occupation that had been, that had outlasted the rest of the George Floyd uprising last fall. Um, so the, the protests were mostly dying down and people were kind of ignoring what was happening in George Floyd Square. Um, although those protesters were quite determined to stick it out at least through the Chauvin trial, although others would say um, through the trial of all four officers that were involved in the murder of Floyd. Um, and that's still going to be going until March. Um, and March isn't March now the scheduled date? Um, okay, March. Um, for the other three, uh, they've been postponed in the meantime. Um, and, uh, you know, one thing we were thinking about was how to make the struggle in the square more visible to people. Um, and so we sort of did a collaboration between people in the square. Um, who had been shooting video on their phones since the beginning of the uprising, um, Flow State Films, who are represented here by Kylie and Rochelle, um, and uh, the Center for Working Democracy to produce an informational video that we feel like captures some of the spirit of the square. Um, and once that's done, I'm going to sort of update about where the square is currently and talk a little bit about the basic dynamics and activities in the square. Um, so let's start with Some of you may have probably seen this. I apologize, um, but I'm pretty sure you may have in Chicago. This is real.
have redefined what community safety looks like. And you know what we found? Community brings safety. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is uh, sort of update where we are um, in terms of uh, this ongoing protest. Um, the, the video sort of ends 200 days in, um, which is January or it's around January. Um, and the city had been threatening to reopen the square for since August, I think the middle of August. Um, and it seemed pretty clear that the plan at the, over the winter was to assume that the square wouldn't be able to survive the Minneapolis winter, which, I mean, you know, you're talking about negative 30 degree weather, hanging out on a barricade in negative 30 degree weather isn't great. Um, cars become sort of mobile observation units slash heaters slash bedrooms. Um, so that's sort of helpful. But um, the assumption was that, oh, it's not showing on this one. Let me see. Um, but uh, uh, the square did organize successfully to survive the winter um, and, you know, with somewhat diminished numbers. Uh, but um, the thing that started re-energizing activity around the square was the prospect of the Chauvin trial. Um, so people started showing up at the square again. They started building up for jury selection, which was on, I believe, March 8th. That got disrupted by um, some violence in the square. Uh, the previous day, which resulted in the square initially being shut down um, to outsiders during the initial period of the jury selection. But um, the city of Minneapolis basically fortified the downtown courthouse, sort of like the green zone in Baghdad. And that had the effect of pushing media organizations, protesters, and sympathizers back out to the square. Because um, you have to hang around a bunch of barbed wire and concertina wire with guys with guns all around you. Um, uh, and so activity started being recentered in the square. And um, uh, April 20th, which was the day that Chauvin was found guilty of second degree murder and third degree murder in Manhattan, I believe, um, you saw a, you know, a couple thousand people in the square again, along with media organizations from around the world. And they've been sort of building up to this for a while. Um, again, the day was, um, well, no, I'm sorry, that's not right. But, um, uh, so verdict day, you start seeing the square becoming the center of protest activity in Minneapolis again. And it started looking like it was going to be the center for a possible new uprising in the summer of 2021. Um, the mom that momentum was built on uh, with the Angelversary Angel event on May 21st. So this is the Angelversary of George Floyd's murder. Um, and Janelle Austin in particular, along with some of her colleagues, organized a um, very successful event in the square, which culminated in musical performances by Sounds of Blackness, Common, and others, which again brought thousands of people back into the square. Um, and so, you know, immediately people are thinking about next steps, how to build on this, 
um, so on like that. Unfortunately, as is often the case in the square, things that might appear on the surface to be terrific, there's often a underlying current which is trying to undermine that activity. And it is, and I'll come back to this again, it's important to keep in mind that the square is not like most protest occupations in that it's not in a space that is unoccupied by others. It's not Ducati Park, right? It's not the Minnehaha Free State, which was another occupation in Minneapolis in the late 90s. It's not like a lot of these occupations where protesters take over an open space, an unused space, on what is often either public property or unused private property. This is in the middle of a very complicated urban neighborhood on the south side of Minneapolis, which means it's not just self-selecting protesters that are in the square. It's homeowners. It's business owners. Um, there are lots of people there that don't think of themselves as protesters. That are in the square. Um, um, and so uh, there are always sort of countercurrents um, that might be pulling away from the protest. On June 3rd, about a week after the game anniversary, um, city workers start dismantling parts of the square, in particular with a focus on the guard shacks, well, I shouldn't call them guard shacks, worming shacks at the barricades. Um, and they did so not by having the police come in to provide security, but by contracting with a violence prevention group called Agape, which is actually based in the square. And these are um, uh, black men that have have a long, often have a long-standing relationship to the square, um, uh, and um, they get contracted with by the city often to do violence interrupting work. Um, working with gang members, this kind of activity. They're often ex-gang members themselves. But they also are increasingly being deployed by the city uh, to disrupt protests. And in this case, a liberal white mayor chose not to send in the police against a protest for Black, uh, for black liberation that was triggered by the city murdering a Black man on the corner. They chose to use Black men to try and do that instead. And this put the protesters in a very tough bind. It was also considered a betrayal by many. Um, and the, the decision was mostly to not fight it. Um, for a few days, people would come in and rebuild barricades. So the rest of going back and forth, the barricades being taken down, getting put back up. Um, but uh, the main people, the main leaders in the square, mostly made the decision to not get in a bunch of arguments with Black men. Um, that that actually is not in the interest of Black people generally, um, and chose to carry on their protest in other ways, and that continues today. Um, so uh, in August, uh, the Square issued uh, justice demands, justice for release from 001, which contained 24 demands, and those negotiations continue with the city to realize those demands. Um, I remember when I was at the London School of Economics, a bunch of my students uh, uh, occupied one of the libraries and um, uh, went to the director with a series of demands, uh, the director being Clay Calhoun, who's sitting in the back there a minute ago. Um, things like ending neoliberalism in higher education. So which <laughs> sort of like, I mean, I agree, but above my pay grade, like not up to me, I can't do this, right? Um, that those kinds of demands often occur from these kinds of occupations. But Justice Resolution 001 is an entirely reasonable set of demands, um, any one of which could be worked on by political officials in the state no demands for you know billions of dollars or anything um uh but the city has mostly either um strung out the negotiations obstructed the negotiations but there's some reason to think that there's been some progress over the last few months um uh, and, yeah, like that. um so the research um was not intentional it was serendipitous <laughs> Um, I was doing research on street medics as part of a civic care project on the politicization of care. Um, and I was in touch with 612 MASH, which is the street medic organization in the square. Um, and I, I, knew, I knew about the square, and I was taking my daughter to go see it and to drop off a donation for 612 MASH. At which point I asked a very basic question of Janelle, Marsha Howard, and Kia Bible, who are three of the main leaders in the square. Um, there are like, a, you know, I said there, there are two dozen PhD students running around here already, right? And like, no. <laughs> nobody's here. Um, um, and Dave Reagan and I made the decision to, um, sorry, Dave Reagan and I made the decision to, um, uh, that if nobody else is doing it, that we should do it. Like somebody has to be doing this research. Um, so we decided to invest in it. Um, 
That research has been very complicated. It's the most difficult research we've ever done. It is not aided by the fact that this is a protest for um, black liberation and I am an older white man. Um, and you know, it's not that that makes things impossible, but there are clearly spaces that I really should not be in. Um, so I'm not the ideal person to do this kind of research. Um, but nonetheless, uh, at this point, we've collected about 4,000 photographs, we've collected several hours worth of video from people's cell phones, 269 audio files, either interviews or speeches in the square, hundreds of hours of on-site participation, three notebooks of on-site observations, 120, anyway, you get the idea. Um, we've spent a lot of time in the square and um, have gathered a lot of material. And um, sometimes people still give us stuff to make sure that it gets archived. I just got a new chunk of video files uh, last week when I was in Minneapolis. Um, right. So this is partially to frame uh, Janelle's conversation. I just want to talk a bit about what sort of goes on the square. Um, and I sort of see it as the square having three pillars of uh, collective activity that sort of keep the square going as a viable protest enterprise. One of the most important is community defense. And in the early days of the uprising, this was essential. Um, there were threats, not just from the police, which you saw in the Flow State video, uh, but also from um, uh, violent right-wingers, white supremacists, boogaloo boys, uh, all of these sorts of people, Proud Boys, were active in Minneapolis around the uprising. Um, and uh, a similar, not a similar, but a, an occupation that occurred five years earlier at the 4th Precinct in Minneapolis after the murder of Jamar Clark by an MPD officer. Um, that protest ended when um, uh, a number of the protesters were shot by um, right-wing uh, militia people. Um, so the idea of the threat of this is a very real one to activists in Minneapolis. The last major sort of, uh, well, that's not true. The previous major protest was the Flanders Castile protest, but the one before that was the Jamar Clark protests. And that had been basically ended by um, right-wing violence. Um, this sort of declined in importance over time. Um, but the other thing I want to flag about this is that uh, community defense ended occupations in Atlanta and in Seattle. Um, and the main reason was, was because community defenders shot young black men in their community defense activities. Um, and the square has managed to avoid any of that sort of problem. There have been beefs between community defenders and other people, but at no point did community defenders shoot anybody. Um, and as a result, the protest hasn't been trapped by that. Um, but it's made policing a really interesting problem and issue in the square. It's been a cop-free zone basically for over a year. And um, how do you do that um, without having rules and without having people who enforce the rules? And the square has mostly pulled off how to do that. They walk and talk. You know, they're very insistent that nobody can make rules, but they model behavior um, and so on like that. And um, the main mechanism that they use to really deal with major threats is mostly information sharing. Um, so there is an active street gang in the square, um, which uh, is involved in violence fairly often, or uh, gunplay fairly often. Um, and um, you know, despite that, people that are active in the square often feel like it's far safer than it is being outside the square. Um, it's much more, it's much more threatening to certain people to have the threat to, to be subject to arbitrary violence by state officials than it is to, um, uh, than to be threatened by gang members who you know personally and who you usually know what they're shooting their guns off about. Right? Um, so one thing I often say is a lot of people in the square are sort of anthropologists of gunfire. Um, you know, you hear a bunch of gunshots going off, bang, 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 you know, could be anything. Somebody blowing off steam, showing off their gun, um, could be any number of things. If you hear one shot, well, then somebody probably just got shot, right? And then you worry. Um, um, but this is, you know, this gets managed in a way that makes it so that people don't feel particularly unsafe, certainly not in comparison to the threat that comes from state violence. Uh, preservation. Um, so uh, one of the things that keeps the square as a, a protest space is um, the fact that it has become a sacred space uh, for protesters and um, for Black people grieving the death of Black people at the hands of police in the state. Um, it's expanded beyond that, though. So George Floyd is the most prominent um, person who's memorialized in the square, but it's become a memorial for all different kinds of people. And in a way, the square has become a canvas on which a Black community records its dead. 
And the dead come from police, but it also comes from drug overdoses. It comes from gang violence. Um, and all of, uh, you know, all of these people sort of end up getting memorialized in one way or another in the square, sometimes in a bit of tension, but sometimes not. But the memorial is clearly something which is both attractive to the city, um, but also something that prevents the city from simply rolling in guns drawn. Um, the idea that the city would go in violently to take the square when the center of that square is a memorial to somebody who was killed by the city seems problematic. Um, and therefore, uh, this has been one of the most important um, things, making the square what it is, um, making it a symbol for others, but also preventing it from getting uh, rolled up by the police. Um, and the last major activity is well-being. So one of the best articles that I've seen on the square is written by a Minneapolis poet, um, G.P. Patterson, um, who wrote a nice piece in, a, in the online journal Places, um, describing the square as a community of care. Um, and uh, the people in the square take care of one another in a number, in a number of ways. That includes providing clothing, providing food, um, getting people connected to various um, uh, institutions of care, uh, whether that be healthcare, mental health care, homeless, um, um, homeless shelters, um, so on like that. Uh, but the sort of heart of all of that is 612 MASH, um, which is the Meta Collective, which is in the process of being transformed into a um, free clinic. Um, but the medics are sort of known around, um, around Minneapolis. Uh, they often go out to other protests, um, but they are also something which um, has been very effective, along with preservation community defense, at bridging the various social divides that are prevalent in this um, That's terrible. Um, I'm looking at this picture and I'm realizing that Janelle's family is in like half of these pictures. Um, but uh, so in terms of practices, one of the most important is um, building the cosmopolitan canopy. And I'm borrowing this specifically from the sociologist Elijah Anderson, who talks about how urban spaces um, sometimes can become spaces where uh, people from very diverse backgrounds, socioeconomic positions, races and eth ethnicities meet. And that can be conflictual but it also is something which he finds sort of helps generate tolerance in these complicated urban settings. And, you know, I think that 38th in Chicago before the square happened had a lot of the characteristics of a very diverse community, but one that didn't necessarily have bridges built across all of those divisions particularly well. And um, one of the things that has, one of the things that has made the square particularly special is that it has become a vehicle for bridging a bunch of those um, divisions. And in many ways, uh, you know, when people in the square talk, they talk about, now they're talking very much about how the radicalism of their protest is the fact that they've constructed community out of this very divergent, difficult material, right? Um, and rather than the protest itself. Um, um, and uh, so this is something that has persisted even well beyond the ending of the formal occupation uh, when the barricades were up. It has continued to work in this fashion People continue to meet regularly um, uh, and so on like that. So yeah, one of the pictures, um, the two pictures at the top, the one, this one is um, Maddie Ortiz. Uh, she's one of the sort of most visible figures in the square. Um, that's her organizing notebook. Um, you know, she actively goes out to reach, she reaches out to everybody on her block, right? And she makes sure she builds relationships and maintains relationships with them. Um, the other main sort of activity facilitating this is um, uh, community meetings, which happen twice a day, uh, seven, like eight in the morning and seven at night. Um, and the bottom picture is a water gun fight, which I'll never forget because it was right after the first time the city threatened to take back the square and people had been training, you know, doing shield training and stuff like that all week to resist the cops and the city backed off. They didn't do it. And the square organized a barbecue outside event, water gun fight that Thursday afterwards, and I'll never forget the sort of release of tension that happened with that event. Um, so it's not, it's a pretty mundane event in the grand scheme of things, but in that moment, it was sort of an example of a community really, A, taking care of itself, building and maintaining community, and so on like that. Um, memorialization greeting isn't just a matter of the sort of physical memorials, like uh, this is called the Say Their Names Memorial, um, which is an extremely powerful art installation. Um, and uh, this is the morning walk. 
Um, and so this is headstones uh, morning for passage. people. What? Morning passage. Morning passage, sorry. Uh, morning passage, um, uh, which is a list of names of people who have been killed by law enforcement. And uh, the Say Their Names Memorial, which is headstones to people over time who have been killed by law enforcement. Um, and so both of these um, uh, installations attract a number of people. Uh, to the space to, and prompts them to treat it as a sacred space, a space of grieving and of memorialization. Um, but there, it's also become a space that attracts a number of other people from outside the square who want to memorialize um, the taking of uh, the black lives that have been taken. Um, so Emmett Till's family was recently in the square and a mural was um, um, painted of Emmett Till in the square. Um, so, you know, that was a, that was, an early civil rights murder, right? But um, that family still views Minneapolis and Southside uh, and 38th in Chicago as a space where you would go to um, remember um, your fallen relatives. Um, okay, I don't want to talk about this too much because I'm pretty sure Janelle will. Um, say what you want to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can say a lot about that. Uh, um, also, what time is it? One point. Okay, I'm going to wrap this up then. Um, the last thing I want to note is the reshaping of space. Um, so this is a commercial thoroughfare um, on Southside Chicago. It's an intersection, a significant intersection. Um, um, it's the meeting point of four distinct neighborhoods on Southside Minneapolis. Um, but over time, it, it's been sort of turned into something else entirely. And it's inverted the way we normally relate to the street. Um, it's not a place where we, it's not a, um, a, um, space of flow that we simply pass through to get to somewhere else or to you know pick up something uh, at a store or something like that it's become a space where people meet um, and this sort of ongoing uh, reshaping of space sort of in some ways represents the character of the square in any given moment but also the accumulated um, uh, things that people have done to sort of transform the space into something that meets their needs um, as a community and meets their needs as protest um, so they built a number of gardens. Uh, when um, uh, the memorial itself gets maintained on a regular basis, a bunch of planters were built to hold uh, the live plants that were left, at offering, left as offerings at the Floyd Memorial. Um, those planters and the plants in them clearly weren't going to survive the Minneapolis winter. So the builder team then built a greenhouse which then all the planters would go in and they would all survive the winter. Um, you know, so this sort of constant reshaping of space uh, to make it useful um, for the protests and for the community also indicates kind of an architectural vernacular, I think. It's the sort of way space would be if people actually got to construct it in a way that would serve their community rather than to serve the interests of capital or serve the interests of real estate development or the interests of transportation. Um, and, you know, there have been some issues around that. That's, that's one of the, another one of the very interesting things I find about square. Um, so let me see. And then protests. Um, so it's not just that protests started in there. It's also that, um, so this picture was taken when um, uh, anti-fascists in, in Minneapolis were mobilizing against uh, Stop the Steal protests that were taking place at the Capitol. Um, and they had gotten smacked around pretty bad previous weekend and they decided they were going to come back and make sure that they won the next struggle. Um, and so they they organized a craft table at which they did a bunch of signs, but they also made a whole bunch of shields. <laughs> and they went out and confronted the right wing protesters the following week and they clearly came out ahead. Um, and uh, by January 6th, they, the, the protesters at the Stop to Steal protest were out <coughs> by the journalists. Um, they were covering them. Um, another by the way, effect of this is that when the insurrection at the Capitol happened on January 6th, everybody immediately knew everybody from Minneapolis was there because mm -hmm. um, they had all been tracked and all their information was known to everybody in these networks in Minneapolis already. So Unicorn Riot basically immediately published an article which had you know identified all the people in the crowd that were from Minneapolis. All right. Um, I'm actually, I have gone over time, so I'm not going to do that. Um, and just note that the protest continues. Um, so this was taken after the uh, city came in, but um, uh, obviously they still have their demands right there painted on the street. Um, all right, thank you very much. Um, so the next uh, person that we're going to have come up is um, 
June, you leave. I think that she's next on schedule. Yep. Um, and she's going to be talking about. Uh, she, she is um, uh, a postdoc uh, in the Center for Democracy, and um, she's going to be talking about research we've been doing on strategic efforts to rebuild the American labor. Thank you. 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 Thank
So unlike previous um, the studies, most labor scholars, they really look at the traditional union space whenever they want to figure out what kind of innovative you know, organizing strategies are going on. But from very early on, I really wanted to look at the periphery, the outside of the traditional union space. So we intentionally wanted to understand what's going on beyond and outside the traditional union space where the 90%, remember 10% union density in the US, what's going on in the majority of US workers' lives. So we needed to define two main keywords, alternative unionism as a strategic approach to the space of working class struggles, wherein unorganized workers search for alternative resources and pathways in building power inside and outside their workplaces. So within the U US context, we really focused on non-national labor relations board strategies. And the, another key term, um, Believe it or not, I mean, <laughs> so many labor scholars and activists, I find that they just do not distinguish tactics from organizing strategies. Many of them complain these two. So we really wanted to distinguish tactics from strategy. So we define the strategy as a vision that lays out a clearly mapped pathway either to achieve greater union density or to enhance the power and voice of working people in politics and workplaces. So we had four main research questions. Um, we wanted to identify the operating alternative innovative organizing strategies, especially those proven effective in the past decade. And secondly, um, like labor scholars like Tom Urevich claims that alternative labor organizing operates in different arenas of power, not replacing unions organizational power, but complementing it. So we ask what new forms of a bargaining power the alternative strategies have exerted in the process of their actions. <coughs> and the third and fourth questions are related. If the strategies have made any concrete impact, on the lives of you know, working people, are these impacts channeled into a new infrastructure of labor movement? So here you can see how these four questions are connected. So I call this innovative flow. We can apply this almost to any kind of social movement organizations. So I don't wanna name any specific union, but let's imagine like, one big major union. <laughs> they are not interested in alternative labor organizing strategies, which means they are not experimenting with any kind of new bargaining power, and they are not making any impacts on the lives of 90% of workers. Of course, they are not generating any kind of new infrastructure of labor movement. I have specific unions in my mind, but I cannot tell. Especially <laughs> <laughs> in my context, I'm you know, from South Korea. Um, you can guess. So let me tell you a little bit of a method. Um, so we did a media search and compiled the initial list of 50 organizations and continued snowballing during our interview process. And the list grew almost to like 70. So far, we have interviewed about 30 experts, um, mostly organizing director of these organizations. We were quite surprised by their enthusiasm and interest in this study. So now we are developing some workshop themes um, that we can collaborate with, um, with these organizations. So here you can see the types of organizations. Can you see this? Kind of a, so people, in the back, you can actually look back. <laughs> There's another screen. <laughs> so 
know the largest group was nonprofit and worker center. We distinguished these two groups because some organizations like union base, their function is completely different from traditional worker center. Um, and uh, we included various job sectors. Of course, the largest sector was a service, including like fast food, domestic work, and we interviewed actually two major unions who are investing in innovative strategies like SEIO 775 and UHW, for and teachers union caucus like Arizona Teachers United and West Virginia Educators Caucus. And four major platform labor organizations we interviewed, one retail, I'm not sure they are representing retail sector though. Um, targeting Amazon, um, the name organization name is Athena, and two farm workers organizations. <laughs> General characteristics of the workers are low wage, labor intensive, what I call reproductive sectors in which women, people of color, and immigrants are the majority. So um, we identified eight major strategies and found that they are making interventions in three avenues of bargaining power. These forms of bargaining power are not mutually exclusive. Um, they are complementing each other. Sometimes they operate in a kind of an intersectional way. Um, so in the first category, political bargaining power, uh, we look at two cases minimum living wage movement led by Pfeiffer 15. And the second largest kind of category um, we're trying to um, kind of unpack, legislative advocacy, we included um, ballot initiative, domestic workers speed of rights, and tax to reach campaigns such as Tax Amazon in Seattle. And in the second category, workplace bargaining power, rank and file movement led by teachers uh, organizations. And sectoral bargaining, mainly we are digging in um, SEIU 775. And platform regulations, we include four, about like five um, e-worker organizations. And minority and independent union, uh, we interviewed um, farm workers organizations in, in Washington state called FUJ, uh, the way they um, collaborate with um, their very you know, well-known worker center situs. Um, and the last category under the community bargaining power, we look at two cases, bargaining for the common good, not the, the one you are very familiar with maybe, the Chicago Teachers Union, but not the one. We didn't interview CTU, but we found most recent case, um, the campaign called Recovery for Our Connecticut. So we included the case in our report. And the last one, supply chain organizing. I was so happy that we had the case in our report. We interviewed an uh, organization, organization named Migrant Justice. Um, so we kind of completed writing the case analysis so let me give you a glimpse of how each case looks like. So the minimum living wage movement led by Pfeiffer 15 is no doubt one of the most successful organizing strategies that directly redistributed wealth to the low wage workers. We interviewed the SEIU local organizing director of Pfeiffer 15 in California. Adam Baseberg. Um, from last year, they have been pushing a legislation for the fast food sector council in LA. Once it's launched, it will operate as an institutional infrastructure for the fast food workers. Pfeiffer 15 targeted the political arena, not the workplace, and has made a concrete impact in the lives of workers and the impact is channeled into a movement infrastructure building effort, as in the case of the sector council in LA. 
So the sectoral council, I argue, is an advanced model of the previous efforts, such as the Office of Labor Standards in Seattle and the Wage Board in New York. The sectoral council in LA can cover a wide scope of worker demands, such as racial justice and health and safety issues beyond simply the wage. So this is a case under the political bargaining model and the, the community bargaining model. Um, bargaining for the common good strategy. Maybe you know the origin of the strategy, Chicago Teachers Union in the 90s and 2000s. It grew out of it and now expanded into many public sector unions like SEIU 1199, New England in Connecticut. So we interviewed the campaign director of Recovery for All Connecticut and found that they established this statewide coalition with 17 unions, 21 community organizations, nine faith groups last year in response to the pandemic crisis. They are experimenting with a statewide cross-sector bargaining table. The key development from the original strategy of CPU is that they can cover across public and private sectors and the coalition can work as a movement infrastructure for a broader and radical, more radical social movement. Their common good demand this year was progressive tax reform, which was actually thwarted in June. So in this case, they built a concrete movement infrastructure but no visible outcome yet. I don't think that I can share the other one. <laughs> this is actually one of my favorite um, case, um, Indigenous Farmers Movement. So maybe I can come back to this when we have a Q&A or something. So in addition to the detailed analysis of each case, we are now trying to offer a kind of a macro view of all these eight strategies, which will include mapping key strengths and constraints of each cases. So let me conclude with um, two main arguments that I can make today. <laughs> the areas left out of the purview and protection of the National Labor Relations Act are actually the space where most promising labor organizing strategies have been experimented on in the past decade. Far from the common belief that these workers and sectors are unorganizable or the dead end of labor organizing. The alternative organizing strategies have had concrete impact on the lives of working people directly redistributing wealth, like 5 for 15, the minimum wage movement in the past decade and ballot initiative, um, maybe we will be able to talk a little bit more about it later, um, and improving working conditions um, like domestic workers, their rights. Expanding the scope of bargaining table to broader community and the political arena, bargaining for the common good strategy, and like rank and file teachers movement. Um, and in a limited sense, I argue that they are reconfiguring the infrastructure of a labor movement. So in our next step, um, we want to really dig in the questions of the new labor movement infrastructure and the scaling on models of alternative strategies. So it sounds very abstract at this point, but just let me share one of my key kind of struggles. As, as you can see, these efforts are all kind of fragmented, exactly the way the workforce, the labor market is structured, right? If we have to imagine a new kind of you know, labor organizing space, which will not look like the industrial union, the way we know how the factory is built and organized, what kind of a you know, space we can imagine. This quote is from a book Michael recommended highly, Marshall Gunn, Why David Sometimes Wins. Um, 
study about United Farm Workers Union. And he said, strategy requires the courage to venture into the unknown, risk failure, say no to current demands. So we, we remember this image that really you know, occupied my brain from early on. So remember, if we can connect these four efforts into a larger circle, can we imagine like the space of organized labor can grow? And if we need a new kind of a infrastructure of movement, what it will look like? So that's it. Okay, uh, and uh, the last for this um, first panel, um, Mary Margaret Fono, Indulata Prasad, and Jun Lee, who is going to come up to the podium? So Indulata is um, a assistant professor in the School of Social Transformation and a friend of the center. Mary Margaret Fono is a emeritus professor in the School of Social Transformation and uh, one of the driving forces that brought the center to ASU. Um, and uh, they have been working on a project on social reproduction and the infrastructure of care. So they will be talking about that now. Thanks. I'm just going to set the stage a little bit and then my colleagues are going to um, carry on from there. This has been a year long collaboration of reading articles of having uh, twice a month meetings, uh, discussing concepts that we are trying to use to critically unpack the notion of essential work. So essential work has been at the center of the public debate since the outbreak of the global pandemic. Despite the terms widespread usage and politicization, there's little theoretical grounding and critical analysis of the, the term essential work. So our project aims to initiate a critical conversation on the notion of essential work situated in the conjuncture of unfolding global protests against neoliberal precarity and racial injustice. In particular, our uh, research aims to offer ethnographic data for the unfolding global dialogue among progressive organizations such as trade unions, feminist organizations, and racial justice groups on reclaiming public service eroded by the neoliberal austerity measures. We situate our understanding within the long history of feminist scholarship on social reproduction and more recent scholarship on the care economy and the infrastructure of care. Uh, we use a transnational and intersectional lens to help us unpack the meaning of essential work in India, South Korea, and the US, and to explore how the experiences of essential work vary by gender, race, class, caste, sexuality, uh, disability. So this is a, we're just throwing around our ideas. We haven't actually, we don't have results. We don't have an argument yet. So this is like trying to unpack uh, the notion of essential workers. So essential workers are workers. This is the um, Department of Labor's definition. So essential workers are workers on the front line of providing services and products that maintain the safety and well-being of the general population and include a wide range of occupations in healthcare, social services, education, transportation, public safety, agriculture, and food service. One in three of these jobs are held by women, um, and that these jobs that fall within the category of essential work. This is particularly true for women of color. For example, in the US, the healthcare sector, which, is, which was the fastest growing sector before the pandemic, women made up 77% of the workers, placing them at a disproportionately high risk for contacting the virus. And we saw the um, statistics play out in terms of the racial disparities um, among the people who died from COVID. But um, in, uh, there's a website called On the Front Line that is a joint investigative journal uh, uh, program, uh, effort by The Guardian and Kaiser Health Newsletter. If you go to that website, you'll see uh, little vignettes of all the healthcare workers that have died from COVID. And in their estimation that this is conservative, um, 3,500 um, healthcare workers, mostly nurses and health support workers, uh, died. One in six nurses tested positive for COVID. Um, 
And the World Health Organization says that over 100,000 healthcare workers um, have died uh, of COVID. And of course, these are like way under uh, reported. So the um, range of occupations that fall under healthcare worker is everything from doctors, nurses, therapists, to licensed practical nurses, personal care aides, hospital orderlies. 83% of the women and 50% of minority men in this sector earn less than $30,000 per year. And, may, and many lack sick leave and health insurance. Not surprisingly, the pandemic hit workers of color disproportionately, but at a much younger age. And one of the um, uh, startling statistics in this particular study of who died had to do with age. And the average age of the healthcare worker that died was 60, which is much younger than the uh, national average of the people who died. So that means these were younger workers who left behind families um, who were active in their uh, unions or in their churches or in their community organizations. So these healthcare workers left a big hole um, in, in society. Now, um, paradoxically, women workers were overrepresented in the hyper-visible uh, uh, frontline work that placed them in direct contact with COVID. But at the same time, they were overrepresented in the invisible expendable workforce that found themselves out of work during the shutdown. Women held 60% of the jobs eliminated during this pandemic, uh, primarily in retail, restaurant, hospitality, and domestic work. Even in the best of times, domestic and home healthcare workers who are disproportionately immigrant women of color lack basic labor protection earn low wages and have little access to health care. These are the workers who clean our homes, take care of the elderly and the disabled, and watch after our children. The workers described by Ajahn Po, director of the National Domestic Workers Alliance, a national nonprofit workers' rights advocacy organization, as the, worker, the workers who make all other work possible. Labor protections for workers is extremely important during these heightened periods of health crises. And I kept looking for anybody that would uh, talk about or try to see what happened during the AIDS epidemic and how that might be uh, an insight into uh, today's uh, pandemic. And really SEIU was a union that was in, out in front in representing both workers and their patients um, in trying to make the work environment safer. Um, but it was a long struggle to do that. And it seems as though there's amnesia now about the fact that activism could have and can result in, you know, better working conditions, especially around protective uh, clothing. At one point, they were telling nurses to use uh, plastic bags, garbage bags. Um, and then um, the, uh, so these labor protections are, 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 more needed now than ever when OSHA has been gutted. There's no real infrastructure here to ensure that they are um, taken care of. So think of the uh, emotional work required to keep yourself, family, coworkers, patients, and the public safe. Now this is actually advice that I found on the CDC website for grocery store workers. Okay, the advice given to grocery store workers um, is illustrated. Store clerks who constantly were constantly cleaning the workspaces and the shopping spaces while also doing their job of checking you out and cutting meat and stacking the shelves, okay, um, had to deal with the emotional uh, tension involved with anti-maskers and angry customers. Remember, these are workers who are trained, customer is always right. So they're trying to protect customers from the virus. They're trying to protect themselves from this hostile climate. Um, so the, um, the CDC advice was, don't confront angry shoppers. If you feel threatened, retreat to a safe space, comma, preferably lockable. Okay, so <laughs> run and hide yourself in the lock club. This is protecting you from uh, COVID and uh, the fallout, the political fallout. So essential work to the three of us sounded an awful lot like what feminists have been talking about for the past 50 years and falls under the rubric of like social reproduction work. And you can see in Michael's presentation about the George Floyd Square, 
this is another community that is um, built in infrastructure of care. And that has to, uh, that happens when the, the regular structures that are supposed to take care of you don't function or they harm you, right? Okay, so, um, so um, originally feminists were talking about social reproduction in terms of sort of a dual system. There was production work and then there was social reproduction work. And social reproduction work was primarily the unpaid work women did in the home, giving birth, raising children, fixing meals, washing clothes, keeping the house clean so that the worker could show up at the site of production and work. And then of course, capital had you know this free labor that made it possible for the worker to show up and be further exploited. But nonetheless, uh, feminists said, let's, and there were campaigns to pay women's wages for housework. This was like international. Well, that's 40, 45 years ago. Okay, so over time, the theorizing about social reproduction has gotten a lot more sophisticated. And so today, uh, thinking around social reproduction involves not just those domestic things, but any um, activity or service that nourishes and sustains the population. So it can be schools and hospitals and sanitation. It can be um, uh, much broader than just what happens in the domestic sphere. When women start to go into the labor force, of course, the jobs that they went into primarily were the ones that seemed a familiar uh, part of the domestic social reproduction scene. So women's um, labor force participation when, when these services are commodified and, and outsourced, then women uh, are employed in them at lower wages, often in uh, non-unionized sectors. So, um, uh, and then more recently under the COVID, you saw, nobody thinks anymore of these as two separate systems. They overlap and in some cases merge. So during the pandemic, women who, were the ones who managed to keep their jobs and could work from home, right, are also, if they have children who are home from school, you know, it's like there's, there's a blurring there. There's no um, uh, demarcation between the two spheres. Okay, so social reproduction is one of the concepts that we're working with. The other concept, and this is a word you heard already in here, is infrastructure. Okay, who knew infrastructure was going to become a household word, right? I mean, it's just in the news, it's in politics, everybody is talking about um, the infrastructure. So we've been collectively rethinking um, social reproduction that operates um, through uh, the infrastructure of care. Now, when I say infrastructure, what do you, what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think, imp? somebody just say, bridges, bridges. bridges roads, <laughs> right? Uh, reservoirs, maybe. Uh, now they talk about the cables and, um, you know, and, you know, broadband, okay? So that's infrastructure, roads, bridges, power grids, reservoirs, et cetera. Critical studies on infrastructure have expanded our ideas about infrastructure and our work has been influenced by Steve Jackson's notion of broken world thinking as a way to understand the infrastructural labor focusing more on repair, recycling, reproduction, and care. Air Wilson extends the infrastructure to include intimate relationships and relationships of care. Think about like how intimacy is connected to communications infrastructure, like dating apps, uh, even the old fashioned days talking on the phone for hours, you know, like there's a relationship between how this infrastructure is organized and how we relate to each other, including intimate relationships. Very interesting and clever kind of theorizing. Um, oftentimes the infrastructure is like hidden from you. It's supposed to be, it's supposed to operate seamlessly, right? And so like, you don't know it's there or who's doing the work behind it, okay? So when it breaks down or is in need of repair, that perhaps is an opportunity to think about rethinking, you know, what might work. And I think that's uh, one of the directions we want to move in is to think what might an alternative uh, infrastructure look like that was um, more uh, attuned to the care needs. Um, okay, so um, the other angle is the people, um, you know, the Biden original, the uh, Biden's infrastructure plan, it was supposed to include the social reproduction and the physical 
on infrastructure, look how quickly they got separated. Now they're fighting each other for a little bit of space. Okay, so it didn't take but half a second. And then all those senators, how many of them stayed home and did social reproductive work? No. So they're like, what? What? You know, daycare, that's not infrastructure. Taking care of kids. No, it's bridges. It's, it's water. It's roads. Um, and then it, it's sold on the idea that there'll be high paying jobs, all right, if, for the infrastructure repair. And I'm all for infrastructure repair and high paying jobs. Guess how many women are employed in construction today? Less than 10%. In the skilled trades, less than 5%. Okay, that has not changed in decades. So those kind of jobs that are associated with rebuilding and repairing the infrastructure are really not uh, targeted at the kind of work that women, the kind of work women and women of color and immigrant women do is home health care, home health care, schools, daycare centers. Okay. If you invest in those, you know, you then improve the economic well-being of women workers. But of course, capital doesn't want to pay what the true cost of care is. So we get, uh, you know, low wages, we get an expendable workforce. If they really and truly had to pay, um, you know, they say we'll go bankrupt. And you see that with the infrastructure. What? We can't use trillions of dollars for infrastructure. We can't give free community college, you know, uh, without ever thinking about why. Why isn't there enough money to pay for this? You know, like who's, who's not paying their fair share of taxes? Okay, so all of these things get intertwined. Um, so, uh, one of the things, um, we want to turn our attention to, and I'm going to turn it over now to my colleagues is that we want to sort of pay more fine grained attention and detail to the experiences of essential workers. Okay. Like what are their, what are, what are their, um, concerns? What are, the, what resonates with them? What kind of politic might be possible? if you give voice to the essential workers. So Indu is gonna talk about So thank you, Dr. Fano, for a wonderful uh, summarization of what we what we've been up uh, to you and included uh, for the past year, year and a half. Uh, these have been conversations that have sustained us through the pandemic. Uh, it has been very invigorating and productive to think through a very difficult time. Uh, I primarily will be focusing on essential workers. And uh, in the context of India, um, some of the things that, that came up for me and, and, and uh, kind of provide two vignettes that kind of uh, helps one, a very personal one, and one, uh, uh, a one that has been relayed to me through colleagues in India who have been engaged in essential work. And, and through conversations that have been going on for over a year, year and a half. So invisible, and I titled this section as Invisible Essential Workers in India. It's a work in progress, uh, something that I, we are thinking through. In the context of India, essential work and infrastructures of care are laced with idioms of caste, Dalits, former untouchables, at the bottom of the caste hierarchy, are primarily responsible for undertaking tasks related to waste removal, and disposable, disposal and handling of the dead. Um, terms that are normally come, have come to be associated with the pandemic, such as quarantine, social distance, and physical distance have long constituted the lexicon of untouchability. Although discrimination based on the concept that some people are untouchable 
because of their association with quote unquote polluting forms of labor has been illegal since 1950. Untouchability remains socially relevant and widely practiced in India and continues to dictate valid lives and lived experiences. So there are approximately, according to one study, 93% of the people engaged in sanitation work are adults. Um, for example, rather than can just, um, so what, I, what we're thinking through here is that rather than consider the dangerous and polluting forms of labor undertaken by Dalits as important to the well being of the nation, the work has been taken for granted and remained unacknowledged. In the perfunctory state led performances of gratitude and appreciation of essential workers during the pandemic in India. The ongoing invisibility of such labors in, uh, is seen in their absence. And this mural is from uh, the newspaper, The Hindu, and I think it's May 2020 because it was last year. Um, but um, what you see in this uh, mural that is being painted uh, at that time, I think it's July 2020, 2020, is that you see the picture of a doctor, a healthcare professional, a policeman, a journalist. But what is missing is that, that the picture foregrounds, the sanitation worker, uh, most likely uh, uh, a Dalit uh, by caste. So between, so India particularly had two phases that were particularly very, very, um, 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 that stood out right, in terms of the magnitude of death and destruction um, was uh, the, the, the migration that had the, the uh, rural urban, uh, the urban rural migration that happened during uh, the first phase of the pandemic. Um, and, and the migration was referred to as one of the largest ever since the partition. Um, so that was that. And the second one, which uh, I will be talking about today, is the one that happened between May, April and May. Uh, that was very devastating. So in reading the obituary of a close family member in May, 2021, I realized the salience of two people who most likely were the only ones to personally attend to the person, uh, to be next to them, and as, as uh, they inch towards their death, laboring to breathe. They conveyed via written notes that their throat was parched and that they did not have food or water to drink, uh, in the government hospital uh, that they were admitted to. In the absence of any doctors, administrators, or uh, administrators or nurses willing to uh, listen to them or to the people who were uh, who had admitted them uh, to uh, them uh, there um, and provide the care and medical attention they needed, um, two people stood out. And uh, in that obituary that I was reading, that the two people have been identi were identified as the morgue boys. In the, uh, um, the two men oversaw, and the morgue boys in that hospital were responsible for overseeing the handling of the bodies of the, who died. And because of so the shortage of nursing and doctors, I think the doctor, uh, the on-call doctor said that there were 2,500 2, patients that he was responsible for at that time. And the nurses were very hard to get. So in, in all that scheme of things, uh, the morgue boys were willing to and able to provide the care that was needed. It is only after the passing of this dear uh, family member that I realized that, uh, that you, know, you kind of re retrospect as to why and how they became available when labor itself, care labor itself was so sh in, in shortage. And I realized that they had asked me, can I feed the person? And, and in, 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 in thinking, in, in retrospect, it was basically a permission that can I touch or can I feed because you're transgressing caste boundaries in that moment. So that's a personal vignette that I wanted to share, which I, in, 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 the, in, the, in the paper, referred to as death one, um, because death was an overwhelming um, experience at that time. And the second, which I referred to as death uh, two, is that as I struggled to make meaning of death and personal loss, when I shared this story with a colleague in India, he told me many more unknown and unacknowledged COVID deaths have occurred. He had just learned from a distant friend that uh, that a distant uh, from a distant friend that a relative had died in a government hospital in the state called Uttar Pradesh, eastern part, talking a different, very different state here. The person who had died was not a nurse. He was not a uh, a doctor, they were not a doctor, but a Safai Karamchari, in Hindi, uh, a, a essential worker, sanitation worker, who had been hired by local villages on an ad hoc basis 
to transport the dead bodies that were piling up in the government hospitals back to the family with the complete funeral process. If people were following the news at that time, uh, cremation being one of the main form in which you dispose the bodies of, it was burning, the fires were burning nonstop. Um, then uh, the person I call uh, Sanjay here. Sanjay, uh, while taking care, he was, he was called from a nearby village, but by virtue of his uh, caste, he was pressed into the service of taking care of the dead. Uh, he contracted COVID in the hospital. However, he was not deemed fit to get the medical attention in the very hospital he was attending to. So with, the, with, the, with COVID, he did his, the sanitation work that was required of him. When his condition did deteriorate, he was asked to go back to his home, where he died three days later. Now I present, and then this is a sort of summary that, uh, that I, we're trying to think through uh, in terms of what, what meaning do we make of this death and what does the pandemic do for us? Um, is this what we are seeing in the pandemic, a new phenomena or an age old phenomena that has existed and the pandemic serves as this magnifying glass where you get to see the people. Um, I think uh, Dr. Fenor referred to as infrastructure. The infrastructure is also consists of these people, the repair work people. So what it does is basically magnify something. So I'm seeing the pandemic as a magnifying lens through which you can see these social relations, these debilitating social conditions under which sanitation workers are working, most of them being women, most of being from a particular caste, uh, primarily Dalits in India. So, in it, so I present the circumstance of a personal loss uh, in conjunction with the seemingly distant and unrelated death to provide some ethnographic insight. And I am trained as an ethnographer and therefore the need for ethnography for me. In, in workings of a pandemic, in both rendering provisionally visible and engendering cat categories of essential work and workers and the infrastructure of care, in both instances, we no notice a collapse of infrastructure of care on a massive scale. A scale. What, what comes to mind is there is an implosion. But what, 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 in, what does that implos implosion mean? What does it signify? Has the infrastructure failed? Or are we just witnessing something that has been designed to fail? Mm -hmm. uh, we're still trying to explore that. Um, we also come to see how despite being completely unprepared, untrained, the community, and in this uh, by sanitation worker community, uh, has stepped up and took up risky tasks that others whose job, who were trained to perform those jobs have abdicated or have, have chosen not to or are just overwhelmed. So there is a way in which there is a particular section of population that has stepped in where others more privileged uh, could kind of step aside at, in, in, in this moment. They perform the essential work deemed as dirty and impure, again, uh, lexicons of caste, uh, of untouchability, even in circumstances that were detrimental to them and further stigmatized them. Yet they remain invisible from the narrative of uh, essential work and the workers. As I, as I, as I have illustrated in the salutary, uh, salutary uh, celebrations of COVID workers, which was deemed as, they were deemed as COVID warriors. But who are these warriors, uh, if not them? So uh, more on the performance of, uh, uh, performance of uh, celebration rather than actually uh, thinking about who are these people uh, uh, that, that are doing the dirty work, the impure work that is then uh, able to sustain what we are uh, calling an infrastructure of care. Um, so the hope is to uh, analyze these two, to, to, to analyze death per se, and, and to understand, it are, to understand what sort of death is this. Um, and and, and as, as, a, as a group, as we think about it, as this, uh, we've been coming around the, the terms, quote unquote, permissible death and acceptable death uh, as part of an infrastructure of care, where uh, repair uh, is, not, uh, is, 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 is sustained, not through mechanism or development, but in this case, this disposable body of uh, labor or this disposable uh, uh, people. Uh, that has been marked as always excluded or on the margin. So I'll just conclude with that. Thank you. I'm not sure I can actually um, add my portion to this. Uh, do we have time? No. Okay. 
You should present. Yeah, you should. We can hear you. So, so maybe you are wondering what's going on here. So three of us are writing a paper together. So this is my portion. I'm going to just quickly read um, this section. Um, another kind of, you know, vignette or a kind of a seen um, that you can understand what's going on around the world, not just here uh, where we are living. Um, in the midst of the summer heat wave and the world class social lockdown, a middle-aged female janitor finished her work day lying on the floor in the dormitory building where 190 students resided commuting, commuting to the main campus of the Seoul National University. The media and the university authority, including a few vocal professors, responded to the premature death of a janitor in the dormitory building frivolously, raising concerns on the cause of her death. She was not infected with the COVID-19 and considered relatively young and healthy among the janitorial workers in the university. The medical diagnosis of her death was myocardial infarction you know, heart attack, a common symptom of overwork that caused numerous deaths of delivery workers and nurses in the country even before the pandemic crisis. A social diagnosis is so complex that it will be settled between the employer side, the remaining family members, and the labor union. Janitorial work is socially considered easy and suitable for middle-aged and elderly women because cleaning does not require any specific skills. Further, it requires intimate and familiar feeling, as people feel most comfortable when public <coughs> restrooms are cleaned by Korean women, especially older women. Unlike other sectors such as restaurant, agriculture, and sex work, where the number of migrants keeps increasing in South Korea, Janitorial work is conducted entirely by Native Korean women. With the added social necessity under the pandemic, the intensity of a commodified cleaning labor that includes picking up used masks, sorting out plastic containers of delivered foods, and sanitizing all the areas people touch could lead a relatively healthy woman in her 50s to death. She cleaned the dormitory building, housing 190 students alone, covering all the dorm rooms, bathrooms, and common areas. Her husband commented in an interview that she used to groan about the exponentially increased size of trash and recyclable as the lockdown restricted students' mobility for months. So she was a labor union member and employer directly, employed directly by the university. So none of the privileges enjoyed only by a small fraction of workers in the country, the category of a unionized regular worker could protect her from the country's labor competitive edge overworking to death in Korean auto time. This story still hides some critical social dimensions of the janitor's death in the summer of 2021. As the pandemic news continues to dominate the media headlines, the hyper-visualized numbers chosen carefully through the predetermined political priorities by the government authorities, including newly empowered medical experts, shape the ways we see, feel, and navigate the world. As the knowledge of infection and death is hyper-visualized -visual in numeric form, the human experience of life and death has been more remote and, in, and in accessible, inaccessible for many. Certain forms of life and death fail to register to the new social knowledge and are permanently delayed to be known or felt. So we call this a slippery category of knowledge of human life disarticulated in the pandemic time, permissible death. On the one hand, death became knowable in the determined social scale worldwide, on the other hand, many forms of unregistered loss are not only unscalable, but becoming socially permissible. How are the transnational knowledge roots of inclusion exclusion determined? 
which death is permitted to be unknown? What forms of life is worth to be protected and cared for? In the seamless operation of vaccine production and circulation worldwide, what we notice is the organized discrepancies that are reconfiguring the spaces of a transnational. Certain areas and deaths never be soundly connected to the global circuit of the knowledge of life potential. That is what we call social reproduction potential of the globalized humanity. Well, I said a terrible example of where I'm at. Um, so we are running a bit behind. But I do want to give people the opportunity to ask uh, the panelists a couple of questions, um, and then we're going to take a relatively quick break, and we're going to move into introducing the Center Fellows, uh, which is the next panel. I also want to encourage everybody. You got a sandwich. Um, we have extra sandwiches. If you have not had one, please do. Um, but yes, uh, questions for the panelists. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I had a question about um, uh, a, a, a specific example, um, the difference between strategies and tactics um, in, in labor organizing. I was just curious if you could say a little bit more about that. Yeah, sorry that I didn't really include any details oh, of that gosh. argument. <laughs> um, you know, like strike. What do you mm -hmm. think it is? Fast track. Sorry? Tactics. Tactics, right? Tactics are like short term. And when you are in a fight, many of our interviewees articulate it. It's more contingent to a specific environment or specific constraints. So you need to be very like flexible. But unlike tactics, strategy is long term. Anyone in the movement know what they are doing for like the coming 12 years. Most of the cases that we studied, they lasted for a decade. When they, they continue to accumulate some kind of outcomes, they fail at some point, they win next time. So strategy is a vision and a pathway, a very clear, clearly mapped pathway. Everyone can see what we are doing, but tactics are not, right? Does that make sense? Strategy is flexible. I'm with the UH study, so it's, a strategy Thank is you. flexible. Yes. Mm -hmm. It is very visionary. And mm -hmm. you're, you're adapting to the to the, the cost. You're adapting to the reality. This is a distinction that we talk about a lot internally, and mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. it can get confusing. But I mean, one thing that's very clear is that, um, and that motivates June's discussion, is that a lot of the labor is in crisis. Labor movement is in crisis. And what we sort of find and what we're reacting to is, is um, what we see as a sort of interminable tactical discussion amongst people that are trying to think a way out of labor's crisis and very little discussion of strategy. And that is a conversation that we want to facilitate um, between union leaders, between activists and academics. Um, people like Lizbeth, people like Dave, um, um, but it's also one that we feel like is really kind of missing at this moment. Um, and, you know, as Dave Reagan, who I believe is still with us, um, and will be with us later for sure, um, you know, he'll often point out that the labor movement's on a clock, right? Like, if we don't figure out a strategic way out of the binds and dilemmas of the labor movement, there's not going to be much of a labor movement pretty soon. Um, so it's it's one of the imperative pieces of work that we have at the center. But June just gave a very good demarcation of how we think about the difference, um, and that's clearer than most of our conversations. So yeah. thank you. <laughs> so I know as a feminist, I really had a hard time to really use this kind of language in a very militaristic kind of you know. We always <laughs> have to imagine a kind of a war situation, uh -huh. right? A fight. What if it's not a fight? What if it's something like creating something completely new, a new organism of a labor you know, movement for workers' lives? So we are really kind of constrained by the, the traditional languages. And another book in this summer that really inspired me, maybe many of you know, um, Adrienne Marie Brown's Emergent Strategies. Yeah. Maybe that book is more relevant to many young social movement activists. That's Definitely. a book actually that I've seen passed around in, in George Floyd Square. Yes. <laughs> okay, I just 
Okay, yeah, Ben. Yeah, so I have a question about the um, infrastructure discussion, which I, I found that really interesting. Thank you guys all for that. Um, but the the notion of infrastructure seems to me really interesting and productive here. So first of all, it's sort of striking how many people in Congress seem to be seem to have been reading in infrastructure studies, right? I mean, the sort of expansion of the concept. And, and yet, one of the things that's that's quite interesting that's happened in the context of the pandemic is the is the, the, the troubling, not just of sort of infrastructure, but of the public-private distinction, which often gets attached to it. So physical infrastructure, bridges are public, right? So it's public infrastructure. And part of what the, the sort of US domestic debate around infrastructure investment has been about is, you know, well, these are the things that you do in the home, or these are the things that are sort of, you can, you can outsource from the home, but they remain in the sort of space of, of the private or something below the level of the sort of public and collective. And yet, you know, around the world, um, governments stepped into the space of the private and responded to a profound disruption of labor everywhere. And yet the differences in the way, so in other words, converted, you know, a kind of private market economy into a space of almost immediate urgent infrastructural investment for the preservation of that structure during a period of profound disruption, structure. And yet the differences in the way they stepped in say something about the ways in which those formations are understood. Um, well, vis-a-vis -vis public and private, but other things as well. So, you know, just for example, you know, we in this country established a sort of unemployment, assumed that the market would take its course and establish a sort of response to unemployment. You know, the first response that was taken in South Africa was to immediately invest in, in um, subsidies for childcare, basically, to, and to generalize them, so to make them. So anyway, I just wonder whether that's come into what you've looked at, because in a sense, it's a crumbling infrastructure in the context of the pandemic, which makes it visible and, and brings up questions about what is rightly left to sort of natural or naturalized forms of association that are sort of private or quasi-private versus the sort of um, structured and structural and reproductively structural commitments of, of um, you know, of sociocultural, political, and economic regimes um, that, that in effect hold things still and suddenly have to acknowledge that when, when everything stops staying in place and the bottom falls out underneath it completely. I mean, I, this is one of the things we're trying to figure out. And like, we're talking across three very different countries that are facing similar circumstances and responding differently. Um, so I'm not really, I, the whole thing about the, um, in the US, you know, it's the profit motive. The investment in the infrastructure is to ensure that goods are transported or, you know, it's not for the public good. It's for, in the private sector, it's for making money. And if you can't make money off of it, it, you know, isn't something under your purview. And it's left to the people who are marginalized and left out of the, the, the distribution of goods and services to come up with some new strategy for achieving them. We're not really sure. We're hoping that we can come up with some like, crazy new way of thinking about infrastructure. Because my worry is everything now is about infrastructure. What does infrastructure really mean? And you know, how does it vary across countries? I know in comparing the US, Canada, Australia, um, and uh, Britain, the poverty rates in the US are often attributed to single heads of households. Okay, so the, re the, the having a single mother raise kids, is, it becomes the cause of poverty. If you look in other countries, Norwegian countries, the same number of women um, are single parents, but they don't have that same rate of poverty because they have a infrastructure of child care and creches and subsidized leave. And, you know, so like that's one way you can look at shoring up. But you know that in, that involves taking on capitalism. I mean, it's that's why it's so hard to do here. But 
Um, oh, thank you. So the literature that I've been reading in and the ethnography that I've been following, um, what happens when infrastructure breaks? So there is a pipes uh, um, that has broken, and so who gets called in? And it usually follows, like in the case that I'm looking at, it usually follows that while the technology is there to construct infrastructure, to maintain that infrastructure, it's usually particular bodies and layers. So I'm not sure if I'm answering the question, but it seems that somewhere, and I think it comes back to the conversation we were having yesterday about this notion of repair, because infrastructure needs to be maintained. So the notion of repair came up, but um, again, what does repair look like in particular social, political locations and uh, what constitutes repair? For me, um, from the ethnography that I'm looking for, it seems that it is basically reproducing age-old forms of manual scavenging. So the critique from manual scavengers of supply of sanitation workers come from is uh, you cannot go on building toilets. You have to invest in how to improve the mechanism that can then call for automation automation of some of the uh, how it's cleaned or maintained. Because some of the infrastructure that is being put in place is reconstituting old forms of uh, labor that has been very uh, discriminatory. So I don't know if I'm answering your question, but this is weird in how, um, what is happening in India at this uh, moment, where there is a critique from the uh, sanitation workers saying, you, constructing more bathrooms or toilets is not the answer. It is about, you have to look at it in a way as to how it's connected with sanitation issues, water issues, and there are like a whole bunch, it's, it's interconnected. And that these uh, sanitation workers need to be at the center of this whole, rather than on the periphery or uh, added to at the end. So that's that's the insight that- I really appreciate uh, your distinction between public um, infrastructure and private um, infrastructure, maybe the investment of the private sector. We had this conversation yesterday that maybe we need to really push uh, the critique of repair, yeah. thinking about starting from where it's broken, but if we push further, how we can undo the infrastructure of the industrial capitalism, you know, fewer, um, faster, fewer industry, right? Undoing already existing infrastructure can be part of feminist project. Um, what did we look like if we have to get rid of all your industry, right? I think you better go on to the next session. Um, we want to get started on the second panel. Um, so, uh, you know, again, this was this is partially a working conference and partially a um, public conference. Um, but one of the purposes of this conference was uh, to introduce a number of people to each other, um, people who have connected in various ways over the last year, um, to give them a little bit of space and time to um, hear from each other, uh, talk to one another, and so on like that. Um, and uh, with that in mind, in this section of the schedule, we're going to be hearing from uh, uh, center fellows, both doctoral fellows in two cases, and hopefully an activist in residence in the third case. Um, so, uh, uh, Ben Case uh, will be up first. Uh, ben Case, we just hired and will be the project lead on a ballot initiatives project. Um, ben is a sociology PhD from the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, he does work on um, violence and nonviolent protest and their relationship to efficacy and success. Um, he's done some work on riot, rioting and solidarity. Uh, he has uh, done research work for um, uh, Healthcare Pennsylvania, so we're already familiar with some of the union environments that we're working in. Um, and he will be up first. He will be talking about his dissertation research, uh, When Yelling Isn't Good Enough, Rise in Civil Resistance. And I'm going to go ahead and introduce the next two as well right now so that we can move through this. Uh, Jiyun, we've already met, but she has been a um, postdoctoral fellow at the center for a year already. Um, and she is leading up the um, uh, Union Strategies Project. Uh, and she will be talking about her work today on um, labor precarization, the financialization of social reproduction. Um, and then finally, uh, Janelle Austin. 
uh, we'll be talking. Uh, Janelle Austin is, um, a, we're trying to arrange an activist in residence, uh, residency here at the Center for Work and Democracy. Um, she would be the first such activist in residence. Um, and she is the co-founder of the George Floyd Global Memorial in George Floyd Square. She also directs the Racial Agency Initiative. Um, and she's been an important leader in that protest in Minneapolis over the last year. Um, so Ben will go first, then we'll hear from June, and then finally Janelle. Um, so Ben, turn it over to you. Okay. Well, let me also say one more thing, which is I introduced um, Kylie Kristauskas and Rochelle Shapiro from Flowstate earlier today. They are doing some <coughs> B-roll shots. <laughs> <laughs> that really bothers you, you might want to step to the side. Um, or, you know, wear your mask. Or demand compensation as an extra. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you should talk to Kylie about that. <laughs> okay, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Ben. I'm very excited to be with you here at the Center for Work and Democracy. Today, as Michael mentioned, on uh, my dissertation research at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, hopefully, we can uh, fit right into the um, seemingly interminable tactical debates that Michael uh, mentioned. Um, so, uh, my main research question uh, is how do riots factor into civil uprisings? Um, or, put a different way, how do we understand violent tactics within otherwise nonviolent movements? Um, so I actually wanna start with the idea of nonviolent protests uh, because that's a big part of why I think it's so important that we do research on riots. We have this dominant notion that the only forms of protest that are legitimate, the only forms of political action that can be legitimate have to conform to a very narrow, strict definition of nonviolence. So where did this argument come from? The argument for nonviolence used to be primarily on a moral basis, right? The idea was that any sort of violent action is wrong, our enemies are violent, and therefore our resistance has to be nonviolent for it to be righteous. Um, obviously, there are still people who hold this opinion, um, but in the face of uh, struggles for liberation uh, by the global south and by the oppressed all over the world in the 20th century, and um, accompanying theories of structural violence, um, the, the, uh, the argument for moral nonviolence lost a lot of traction on the left for people who are committed to, um, to social justice. Uh, for the most part, people acknowledge that it can be uh, legitimate to fight back. Um, uh, so the argument for nonviolence shifted, specifically around the work of a political scientist named Jean Sharp, who published in 1973 a very influential book called The Politics of Nonviolent Action, where he argued that Nonviolence isn't important because uh, it's, it's morally superior. Nonviolence is important because it works better. So the argument shifts to a strategic argument. It's about efficacy. It's about what actually works uh, to create change from below. So Sharp has this idea that um, by, by mobilizing nonviolently, we're able to put in play these sorts of power dynamics that kind of conflict the script on violent authority. And there's a number of ways he argues this. The most, uh, one of the most prominent is the backfiring mechanism, this idea that uh, you know, if we protest peacefully uh, and then we're violently attacked by authorities, people see this and they're horrified by peaceful protesters being attacked violently. It increases sympathy for the movement and it increases antipathy for the state, um, thus allowing us to sort of uh, flip the violence of the state against them. This is one of the ways that, uh, that nonviolence is crucial to the dynamics that allow uh, regular people to create change from below. Um, it's a powerful story. Uh, it's been deeply resonant with a lot of activists and, and movements. It's become the standard for the way uh, a lot of uh, movement organizations view, uh, view activist strategy. And it certainly has become the standard for the way commentators on movements talk about protests. Um, it also is reliant on a very selective reading of history uh, and on a, a conceptual slippage between the ways that we define the term nonviolence. So I'll talk more about um, in a moment. Um, and uh, scholarly research on movements in many ways came from the study of riots. Um, but as you know, from the 70s on, uh, as movements came to be associated with nonviolence, at least in sociology, the focus has shifted 
toward um, uh, formal organizations and processes. I think to the detriment of our understanding of the way uh, people can create social change uh, from below. So I argue we, we need to bring riots back into the way we understand um, that kind of social change. Um, so this is an overview of my argument in sort of uh, three chunks. Uh, first, there's no such thing as a nonviolent uprising. Um, so I, I take data on riots and I interpolate them into uh, the most prominent data set on nonviolent conflict to show that in moments of uprising, uh, when people challenge, state, uh, challenge the state, um, uh, these moments always involve the sorts of things we call riots. Um, so then the question becomes, how do those you know, uh, violent uh, collective actions interact with nonviolent? Uh, the dominant view again is that violent actions always demobilize protests. They frighten people away um, and they increase repression and they uh, uh, turn public opinion away from movements and things like that. Um, so I find evidence to the contrary. I analyze data uh, on riots and nonviolent demonstrations in the US and South Africa on the past 70 plus years and find that in the aggregate, riots are actually associated with increased uh, nonviolent protests over time. Uh, and finally, how does rioting impact rioters? Uh, when we talk about riots, it's, it's often in ways that flatten the participants into this sort of group, right, as a, as a, as a crowd thing. It's a, you know, whether we're sort of supportive or against it, um, riots get talked about in terms of mobs, you know, people talk about criminals or thugs from a certain perspective, and, you know, the masses even from a more supportive perspective. Uh, these are all terms that, that kind of erase the people who are actually doing the actions that make it what it is. And so I wanted to talk to writers about their experiences, and I do this in two uh, uh, interview studies, one with anarchists in the U.S. Uh, who participated in black block tactics, and one with student activists in South Africa who took part in the fallist uprisings in 2015 and 16. Um, what we find uh, in both cases is that uh, those moments can have really deep subjective and symbolic effects on participants um, that not only impact their subsequent uh, uh, political organizing, but also um, people's personalities and world views. Um, now, normally in a talk of this length, I would focus on one of these. Um, but since, uh, at least initially, I, you know, the idea of this talk was to get uh, let my colleagues at the center uh, get to know me better. Now here I am talking to all of you. It's wonderful. Um, I thought I would give a, a, a quicker overview of the whole project. Um, I also am aware that we're running a little bit late, which is which is good to know. I'm not sure I'd be able to fully trust the center if it was able to pull off a day long. <laughs> perfectly on time. Um, but nevertheless, I don't want to contribute too much to this. Um, and so I'll check in with you uh, in a few minutes and see how we're feeling about time. I'll do my best to, to sum it up there. Um, before we dig in, uh, I do want to say a brief word on terminology. Um, we're talking about violence and nonviolence. These are really complicated. They're 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 you know, complex terms, they're multifaceted terms. Um, we could go down a deep rabbit hole of definitional debates, which I'm not gonna do right now, but I do wanna say a word about the term riot and the way I'm using it. Um, the term riot is a very fraught term, uh, especially in the US context. Um, a, a very famous uh, movement scholar, Charles Tilley has argued that we should strike riot from our lexicon altogether because it's been over leveraged for rhetorical meaning. Uh, in the U.S. specifically, uh, it takes on racialized connotations. Um, it's used to delegitimize movements. These things are all true. I also think it's important that we fight to keep the term um, uh, because it has so much traction in the popular consciousness. Um, so I use the word riot, um, but I'm trying to use it, at least in the research, based on a more clinical definition, based on mainly two things. One is constituent behavior, so the things that people are actually doing in these moments. And riots actually have a, uh, a stunningly um, stable repertoire of action across contexts, across geographies, and across time. So that's one thing: is sort of the things people do in protests that we would say uh, tra uh, transcend the boundaries of nonviolence. Um, and second is the direction that systemic power is flowing through the event. This is a little more complicated, but basically, I'm distinguishing between anti-institutional violence and institutional violence. Um, Anti-institutional violence has to do basically with punching up against systemic power. So we're looking at things like anti-police riots, food riots, riots targeting major corporations and things like that. I'm not looking at what we call pogroms or 
uh, uh, dominant racial or ethnic groups um, violently attacking minority or marginalized uh, uh, or vulnerable populations. Uh, sometimes those are called riots, they're called sometimes race riots or ethnic riots in certain parts of the world. Um, they can bear some similarities, but they're dealing with very different political and social dynamics. So I'm distinguishing between the two. I'm looking at anti-institutional violence. Um, okay, so um, I have a lot of issues with Gene Sharp's theory of power, which I'm, for the sake of time, going to skip over for the moment. I'm going to focus on the empirical arguments. Um, Erica Chenoweth and Maria Stefan are two political scientists who've become the most prominent civil resistance scholars, the most prominent scholars in nonviolent studies. Um, they published a book in 2011 called Why Civil Resistance Works. Um, and in this book, they present research from Erica Chenoweth's nonviolent and violent conflicts and outcome data set, the NAVCO data set. And what NAVCO does is it takes um, all the conflicts in the world that have challenged the first state power, that have tried to overthrow the government uh, for more than 100 years, and they categorize them into two, two categories. They have violent struggle and nonviolent struggle, right? And they, uh, they have a bunch of other variables, and they compare these for efficacy, for what's, what, what's worked better to overthrow government. And they find that nonviolent uh, uh, campaigns have been about twice as likely to overthrow governments as violent campaigns, um, with the trend line moving toward nonviolent struggle being even more comparatively uh, effective. And they conclude that this is, this is validation of Sharpe's theory. This is proving to us that nonviolence works better. Um, this has been heavily resonant in a lot of activist circles. Uh, why civil resistance works is all over the place among activists. I mean, it's in uh, activist um, manuals and nonviolent direct action trainings. If you read an article online about why nonviolence is important in movements or why riots are bad, it will, to an article, cite this research. This research is the pillar uh, of the argument that nonviolence is more effective in movements. So, what does NAVCO actually do? It doesn't actually compare violence to nonviolence the way we talk about those things on the ground. It compares warfare to civilian uprisings. The violent category in the data set comes from the correlates of war data set, uh, which categorizes all the wars in the world. And they have a subset of intrastate conflict. To make it into correlates of war, a conflict has to have at least a thousand battle related deaths between at least two armed parties. There's a, quite a high threshold for inclusion. Um, the non, so that's the violent category. The nonviolent category they construct themselves um, based on historical references and news and uh, consultant area experts. But crucially, in the nonviolent campaigns, they don't have any variables for any type of violence that falls below the threshold for war. So there's no variable for riots. There's no variable for sabotage. There's no variables for any of this, this stuff. We're just calling civilian uprisings nonviolent because they're less violent than an open armed conflict in war. But it's not really nonviolent. All, all of the debates activists have about whether or not we should be throwing things at, at the police or setting things on fire, all of those debates take place within that nonviolent category, but they're erased in the, in the research, uh, which says nonviolence works better, and that's reproduced in activists, among activists, um, to make this argument that the research really doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, speak to. So I take a variable for riots from the Banks Cross National uh, Time Series data archive um, that has variables for these types of things. Um, they have a variable for major riots. That's riots involving more than 100 people with millions of dollars of damage. This is, a, again, a major riot. And I, I uh, drop that into NAVCO and line up the dates in the countries, and you find that uh, more than 80% of these nonviolent campaigns involve major riots. Um, the Banks data set also has a lot of limitations geographically. Um, it's based on English, English language news sources. Um, so when you go through case by case in NAVCO, you actually bring this number up to almost 100 almost every single uh, civilian uprising that's challenged the state has involved major riots. There's an asterisk on that 100%, which I can talk more about later if you want, but it's about 100%. So as I say, um, for all intents and purposes, there's no such thing as a nonviolent uprising. There are nonviolent tactics. Thank you, June, uh, for uh, uh, reminding us about, about that. Um, and um, there's also organizations that commit themselves to nonviolence. Um, but from, an, from a, from a movement-wide perspective, in moments of uprising, these things always involve the sorts of things we call riots. So the question becomes, how do these things interact? The dominant argument from strategic nonviolence position is that riots demobilize movements. Right? The main uh, mechanism for success, according to Chenoweth and Stefan, also according to Sharp, 
is that nonviolence allows us to mobilize more people on a consistent basis. Uh, riots, they say, frighten people away. They invent repression. They turn, you know, they turn people away from movements. They reduce participation, and that's what that, that's what that's why they hurt uh, movements. So, if we map riots and nonviolent demonstrations over time, we should expect to see if this was true. When riots go up, we should see nonviolent demonstrations go down, right? If, if riots are demobilizing nonviolent demonstrations. In fact, that's not what the data shows us. So this is time series data for uh, nonviolent demonstrations in the blue dotted line and riots in the red solid line. This is from banks. This is the US um, between 1946 and 2017. And as you can see, they almost always move in the same direction. They don't move in opposite directions. And banks is an annual data set. So each of these movements is a whole year. So truly, if we saw a spike in riots in one year and it demobilized people, we should see nonviolent demonstrations dip in the same year. Yet in every, in every single instance uh, of a major uprising, they're both moving in the same direction, sometimes in different proportions, um, but always in the same direction. This is the same data for South Africa. From banks, and this really doesn't take much explanation. The two variables are basically collinear uh, when it comes to South African protests. Um, so when you run the data analysis, um, I run an OLF regression and an Alima uh, time series model. I'm not going to go through the mechanics of those for the sake of time, but feel free to ask about it later. Um, we find that riots are associated with increased nonviolent demonstrations within the same year and increased nonviolent demonstrations in the following year. So uh, in aggregate, riots do not demobilize nonviolent demonstrations. In fact, um, they're associated with increases, especially during moments of uprising. Um, okay, for the sake of time, I think I'm going to actually skip over um, some of the arguments about why this might be, uh, but again, I'm happy to talk about that later over a beer or feel free to contact me about it. Um, there's a lot of reasons to believe that, that uh, rioting does not um, uh, negate the backfiring mechanism. <laughs> um, so finally, I do want to say a few words about the interview studies. Um, which were just really incredible. Um, so I had two interview studies, one, as I say, with anarchists in the US and one with all of South Africa. Um, both produced incredibly rich stories and analysis uh, from people on the ground who, who've been part of different types of, of, uh, of organizing and movements, including in violent protest. Um, obviously, the, the people I, I spoke to are anonymous in the study uh, to protect their security because we're talking about actions that were illegal. Um, but um, I really approach, approach these folks more as co-researchers than as interview subjects. The, the, the level and the sophistication of analysis um, was, uh, was really out of this world. And so I'd like to take you through a few of those quotes, if we have time in a moment, um, just to kind of uh, highlight some of that. But there were three main takeaways that I want to mention before. Um, first is that for, for rioters, the rioting is primarily symbolic. It's not instrumental. And this is really important because the strategic nonviolence uh, uh, school has uh, promoted this idea of really a, a mechanistic look at movements, right? We're supposed to be able to, to um, get positive outcomes if we, can, if we can do the right things on the front end. It kind of looks at movements like a cookbook. We can get positive outcomes if we have the correct inputs, if we measure them right. Um, if, we, if we have just amount, this right amount of disruption and no violence, if we do it correctly, we should be able to get positive results. Um, that's not the way social struggle works in the real world. Um, but ironically, it's also the way violence has been approached in, in scholarly studies of movements. Uh, famous studies of violence and movements by Gurr and Hansen uh, approach violence purely instrumentally. Right? This is something people do when they think it'll work, right? Uh, it's means to an end kind of thing. Um, but for rioters, that's not the case, right? People throwing a rock at the police don't really think that's going to help them defeat the police in open conflict. Uh, people breaking a, a corporate window don't really think it's going to ruin the corporation financially, right? These are about embodying resistance. They're about giving voice to dissent um, through action um, and making a symbol of that. Um, second is that riots have really distinct emotional impacts on participants. Um, when I talk to people about, about these moments, they use, you know, terms like uh, energized, exciting, frightening, terrifying. Um, none of that is very surprising. But a lot of people also used words like magical and euphoric. And the single most common term people use to describe those moments in both studies was beautiful. So there's something going on in these moments 
that induce people with a sensation um, that's different from other types of protests. Uh, and in some cases, this has led people to visions, to liberatory visions, visions of a future in which this kind of struggle wouldn't be necessary. Um, and that's continued to stick with a lot of participants throughout their lives. People talk about coming back to those feelings in, in subsequent organizing. Um, and finally, um, riots have sort of essentially keep the contentious in contentious politics. Contentious politics is a, is a social science jargony term. Um, but you know, here I'm, I'm basically extending the argument of Francis Fox Bennett, who argues that riots give muscle to the demand of a movement in her words. Um, I think that's true, but that's still looking from the perspective of the target. I think it's also true of the participants. Um, I'm putting this in conversation with the disruptive deficit of conventional protests that uh, Hank Johnston and Serafina Superiati theorize, that protest that becomes overly performative, protest that seems to have the form of disruption without any disruptive content, um, can lead people to a loss of, uh, of political meaning. You know, if you've been to enough protests, you've probably been to a protest where you walk around the block and you chant, and you have this feeling that, is this really interacting with power at all? Um, sometimes that's important, but if, if, if it's too much of that, um, I think it can result in cynicism uh, for a lot of activists, that's what people share with me, um, and ultimately um, to potentially the co-optation and, and dissolution. Um, so in this context, um, uh, rioting can, can break through that and sort of imbue people with this visceral sensation that uh, politics is a struggle and, and which side of the struggle they're on. Um, how are we doing on time? Do I have uh, five minutes to, five or, five or seven <laughs> minutes to go through some of these uh, quotes? How do, how do I don't know if I get a straw poll here on how people feel about time. Two minutes. Two minutes. Um, great. Well, uh, maybe I will one from each side. Um, so the first two quotes come from Fallen. These are people who participated in um, a series of movements. Most were from Food Plus Fall, uh, which was about um, a lot of things, but, but sparked by fighting fee increases at, at universities that would have been prohibitive to a lot of low-income students uh, in South Africa, but also Roads Must Fall and Outsourcing Must Fall, which were about uh, fighting outsourcing of labor in universities and fighting to decolonize higher education in South Africa. Um, these involved campus occupations, uh, labor strikes, um, and in many instances, um, physical fights with security. Um, so this first quote is uh, comes from an undergraduate activist at Pitts. Um, and in this, actually, he's relating a sentiment that had been relayed to him by a Palestinian comrade of his who he met when, uh, when the, the, the friend was studying in South Africa and they attended protests together. So he's, um, in describing his own feelings, he's relaying something that was said to him uh, by this friend of his who's talking about throwing rocks at Israeli tanks. Uh, we know it's not likely to hurt anyone, but all of that hurt, pain, frustration, anger, you have to release it somehow. And sometimes yelling isn't good. Rock throwing humanizes you in the face of a dehumanizing situation. Um, so as you can see, this is, uh, this is also the source of the, the title of this talk and, and the title of the book project. Um, so I really think it, it, uh, it speaks to a lot of the things we're getting at. Um, it's not about defeating the enemy in a, in a fight in that sort of a sense. It's about giving voice to this dissent and the need for that to be, uh, to be said sometimes in a way beyond speaking. Um, Michael said two minutes. I'm going to push it a little bit. Um, this, is a, this is another quote by a graduate student activist at University of Johannesburg. She's talking about a, um, a peaceful vigil that uh, parents and, 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 and kids attended in support of the students when police attacked. The police start firing rubber bullets at us. People have been shot in the back. They're laying there and people are hiding out. The cops are walking around with their guns like a war zone. And it's so intense and we're so broken. It feels like there's no hope. So at that point, a bus shelter was burned. And we all thought it was beautiful to see the fire. Because it's what Fanon mentions. It's kind of like a therapy for us. We needed it in that moment. We needed the roads to be blocked and we needed the stones. I'm just going to read one more. Um, the, the next two were from uh, Black Bloc activists. This is an anti surveillance tactic um, that came from Germany and spread across the world in the 1970s. Um, everyone dresses in black. It makes it difficult to distinguish between individuals in a crowd. Um, it also looks imposing and intimidating. These don't always, uh, these aren't always involved with riots or violent protests, but one of the hallmarks of this, of this sort of uh, um, contingent is, uh, is its willingness or sometimes eagerness to riot. So I'll skip this one for the sake of time, um, and I'll just end um, on this one. This is from um, 
uh, anarchist. She's in her 50s now. This is about the first Black Bloc action in the US, which was in 1990, Earth Day. Um, she's talking about an unarrest, which is the act of uh, physically fighting someone out of police custody when, when the police are trying to arrest them. I felt really empowered being part of a group like that. And that was a feeling I wanted people to know was possible. And the unarrest, you know, that we didn't have to go along with the power over us, that we could physically remove ourselves from that kind of power and control. I felt just a fundamental shift in my capitulation to authority. And you know, I was in kind of an abusive relationship at the time, and that day was the end of my tolerance for that. It just seemed like a lot more was possible. So in this example, we see how that experience, um, it didn't just shift her, uh, her political consciousness or her view of, of politics per se as sort of an abstract part of society, but it shifted how she saw her relationship to authority in general. Um, so uh, in closing, um, why is this important? Um, I think if we're viewing movements as, as having to be purely and very narrowly nonviolent in order to work, uh, we're setting ourselves up for failure. I think it's an unrealistic expectation and um, it's a historical. Um, and the arguments for why that should, um, for why strategic nonviolence um, um, actually works, I think are, are misinterpreted. Uh, in fact, uh, in moments of uprising, um, uh, uh, or moments of uprising are riotous, I'll put it that way. Um, so if we, if we really want to understand uh, strategies for, for, for achieving social change, we have to make riots part of the story. All right, so maybe you know what I'm doing already. <laughs> and this is um, some other projects that I've been working on. Um, I actually submitted this paper, uh, resubmitted this paper last night um, to a journal called Capital and Class. So you will be able to read it sometime later this year, I hope. Um, I've been really um, thinking a lot about this issue uh, in the context of South Korean labor movement for many years so far. Um, Um, so the paper is basically about, um, I met this woman, maybe anyone who knows about South Korean labor movement must know this person. Her name is Jin Su Kim. She um, waged um, the longest, uh, we call, high attitude protest um, on the crane in um, one of the largest shipbuilding um, yard in South Korea. Still, South Korea is producing about like 12 really, really huge um, container ships every year. Think about the size of the commodities that uh, we are actually moving across the ocean. And she is the first union leader, female union leader, um, 
and before her, um, you know, it was around early 2000s. So right after 19, 1997, Asian financial crisis, the shipbuilding industry was shaken. So they tried to lay off and the law changed to allow these big businesses to lay off people en masse. So right before her, there were two union leaders who killed themselves in the process of protest, ongoing protest. And she figured out she is not gonna kill herself. Instead, she will survive on this crane, high altitude crane that the machine that she used to build the ship and protest. And what actually happened in the process of protest? Mm -hmm. You can see these people. You know what? I really love um, Ben's description of a riot, but in South Korean context, when you imagine like mass, you know, factory workers, mass strike in South Korea, you can imagine like in shipbuilding industry, everyone is wearing the same uniform, blue one. They sit like straight lines. <laughs> they seriously look like just military. And I heard from one activist who I really admire. And he was saying to me, looking at the crowd, I mean, the people who are sitting like military or like a machine in their uniform and they are protesting, right? And he said, wow, it's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. You know what? I didn't get it. To me, protest looks like this. And in the middle, um, middle of her 309 days protest, she survived in the crane for about a year. You know what happened? She continued to protest every day. She gathered the people, she wrote you know, a statement every morning, every evening. She really tried to gather her union workers, you know, co colleagues to the shipyard and they were keep protesting. And in the middle of the protest, there was this new form of movement now we call Hope Bus. So young people, all different kinds of people around the country started to gather and they drove this bus to the shipyard from all over the country and people started to gather. And they are not the union members. We don't even know who they are. There were like thousands and thousands of people. There were six times crowd we now call Hope Bus Movement. How this was possible? <laughs> The Jin Su Kim, the leader, the female leader, started to tweet. tweet. Wow. <laughs> she was writing. She's a phenomenal writer. She's a phenomenal writer. She was writing not to her union members only, but to like everyone she can reach through online. And it really, you know, attracted this many crowd, and that movement was the beginning of my interest. And I had an event with her a couple of years ago in Seattle. We invited her to our campus and um, we can really celebrate the kind of a moment, but this is technically about um, the problem of is labor movement, how we can reproduce the labor movement. So I'm going to bring you back to the question of social reproduction very soon. Um, so remember the death in the shipyard, people were keep dying. These union leaders were killing themselves. And shipbuilding industry is known for the highest workplace fatality rate. Every year, I don't know the number, but the largest number of workers are keep dying. Another death in public sector um, core based power plant. 19 year old, his name is Yongyun Kim. Now we have a law under his name. 19 year old, right after graduation, high school, you know, graduation. He found this job in the power plant. Um, you know what power plant is, right? He was working at a, the largest um, uh, 
Oakland in the, the, the area in South Korea that actually covers one fourth of electricity of the country oh. in the huge plant after midnight. He was checking the conveyor belt where the core was like moved to the turbine. You know how the core based electricity is produced. <sighs> I still cannot imagine in this huge plant after midnight, there was no single light. And imagine core based plant extremely dusty with the coal, right? You just get in there, you turned out to be like black, black. You just get all the dust in your you know, body and everything. He was using his cell phone to see mm. the conveyor belt. He was found dead next morning, cut into two pieces, 19 year old. I was really shocked. And this kind of death, after his death, continued. This is the data that I could actually find from ILO. No one trusts this, because yeah. you know why. So, but still, it's quite impressive. South Korea from 2010 to 2016 lowered their rate of fatality. Um, they have particular you know, the measure to calculate and we can see all the advanced economies maintain less than 1%, like England, Germany, Canada. But I was really struck by, actually US have the same rate. US have exactly the same rate, 5.2. Still, this is terribly um, underestimated the number. So we don't really know how many people are actually dying at workplace. And in addition to this problem, um, during the pandemic, within like six or seven months when the COVID cases were like exploding, I heard like that 15 death of delivery workers. They said there were 30% increase of workload. You know, people were ordering everything online suddenly, and they couldn't really control the, the, the workload. So we saw within like six months, 15 people died delivering basically the goods that you use. Sometimes people order water, toilet paper, masks. And they say regularly they needed to deliver 3,000 packages a day. Think about that. How you can divide time to deliver 3,000 packages a day. So here are some more data. We, in South Korea, migrant worker staff is increasing. We have just numbers here. It's significantly higher than the, the average, national average. So who are dying? I would argue, you know, the traditional industries like shipbuilding, automobile, auto automobile, and all the kind of, you know, heavy industries, they are downsizing. For various reasons, these workers are you know, dying, killing themselves sometimes. And the public sector, um, what happened in the past decade has been dramatically, you know, the shifted to private companies and those private companies hire subcontractors. Remember the 19 year old, he was the subcontractor, uh, I mean, hired by the subcontracting company. So the fight is still going on and migrant workers are dying in recycling factories agricultural sectors. So I was really struggling um, what I can do and how I can understand this kind of phenomena. You know, South Korea is 10th um, in its economy from the scale now. Its GDP is 10th in the world. And it's actually fifth in its military spending. 
Mm. And <laughs> very recently um, invited to G7. So industry, South Korea is not categorized as developing economies anymore. Industry deepened and technologies advanced, but why the way we work has not been changed. So to think more about the delivery worker stat, what I was really struggling, like in order to deliver 3,000 packages a day, <laughs> they needed to work from six to 10. And in that long working hours, you literally run carrying heavy stuff. And mostly these workers who died, they just died when they were sleeping. Heart attack, mostly. The young people like in their 30s. So the phenomena that I can actually extract from all these examples is that the extreme reduction of social reproduction time. So basically these workers have no time to take care of themselves. They have no time to eat. You know what the 19 year old Yongyun, in his package, people found that he had a instant noodle. So doing that kind of a work, he had no time to have decent meal. So the phenomena, extreme reduction of social reproduction time. How we can understand this phenomena? Just to give you a, some kind of context of South Korean labor, interesting name. Um, labor scholars and activists have been producing aggressively the changing composition of the workforce for the last 10 years. So we have very accurate numbers, unlike the US. So you can see almost like half of workforce, entire working people are contingent workers. They cannot guarantee that they are going to work next year. Worst government is underestimating like 30%. And here you can see composition of um, the contingent workers by gender. Female contingent workers were like extremely high right after the financial crisis. So early 2000s, it almost reached 70%. And now it's like 50%. And you know what? They are making half of the regular workers' wage, even though they do the same job. And the union density this year recorded a 12.5%. Not very different from the US, but I don't know, it's kind of growing, um, but I'm pretty sure that number growing from 10% to 2%, most organizing efforts was made by contingent workers, these contingent workers. So my main inquiry is um, how do those people whose life conditions are fatally contracted in the time of financial crisis, pandemic crisis, climate crisis, experience the time of progress, economic growth. Surprisingly, South Korean economy is still growing. This year, our World Bank you know, estimates that South Korea, even in the middle of the pandemic, will maintain 3% GDP growth. How oh, economy is growing, right? The contradiction between the mode of working class social reproduction and the logic of economic progress is the key argument that I'm trying to make in the paper. And why well, have the I don't know where did I put my <laughs> oh like you said I have like 10. Like, so what I can do, I'm going to just read you through um, some of the key arguments that I made in the paper. Just to give you some kind of quick summary <clears throat> about the notion of the social reproduction. So I use the notion of social reproduction not to simply denote a set of caring apps. So usually people understand social reproduction as just like, yeah, you're taking care of someone like, 
educations, you know, cleaning, cooking. But instead, um, I use the notion of social reproduction as a general contradiction between capitalist reproduction, think about how capital continues to grow, and the broader human and non-human capacity to reproduce a society. The contradiction between these two. While the claim of crisis of care is useful in explaining the phenomenon of individualized practices or deficits of care, the latter approach, the way I understand the contradiction between capital and human capacity to reproduce, that approach articulated in feminist theories of social reproduction allows us to understand the totality of the social relations that constitute the practices and processes of a social reproduction. To be more specific, my focus is the mode of working class social reproduction in contemporary South Korea. There's another key term. <laughs> In order to understand all oh, these kind of changes, we actually need to think about where money is going. So maybe you know what financialization means in some ways. The way I understand um, from classic Marxist understanding, you know, concentration and centralization of capital. Um, capital capitalism's tendency to monopoly. Um, I recommend, highly recommend uh, one of the recent book um, written by Cedric Durand, um, book title is Fictitious Capital. He really offers very clear kind of a picture of what financialization means and how it's unfolding. And the way I understand now is financialization literally means a process of gradual elimination of huge value dimension of a commod commodity. Mouthful, <laughs> I know. There's a distinction between use value and exchange value here. I can give you an example like masks. From very early on in the US, we didn't have masks, right? Do you remember? Um, entrepreneurs in the US, they are not very attractive to producing basic goods or essential goods like masks because it doesn't produce enough financial value. Instead, they invest in vaccine companies. When we were desperate needed masks, no one was interested in producing masks. So that's a very good example of how financialization eliminates essential, socially necessary, use value dimension of goods that we need desperately in order to survive. Instead, people prefer investing in finance. In the paper I show first that the impact of financialization is not limited to the traditional production sphere. And second, how in the post-developmental regime like South Korea, the big companies called the Chebor, Chebor led financialization process penetrates into the sphere of social reproduction. I track this dual process by focusing on how Jebor capital exploits contingent workers to the extent that the level of exploitation leads to the workers' premature death. And the way the Jebber capital invests in reproductive commodities such as insurance, food and retail and entertainment for financial profit. So this double penetration of the Jebber capital into working class lives is intensifying the level of precarity in the spheres of both production and reproduction in South Korea. So it sounds very complicated, but in order to really understand what's going on, why these workers are keep dying, is because South Korean government kind of a poor, I mean, um, stopped investing in welfare. They basically followed the Austro, you know, the neoliberal kind of, you know, the troop and Basically, these workers have no other means but to accept this kind of a death-ridden 
jobs, right? So I propose in the paper, looking closely at these financial digestion processes that provide the general societal capacity to care for and support the populations exposed to neoliberal techniques of exploitation, extraction, and precaritization. I call this general tendency the financialization of a social reproduction that is underway both in private and public spheres, unfolding in variegated forms and uneven patterns across the globe. You know, contingent workers have no other means, such as welfare provisions of social reproduction, but to accept the death rate in jobs, as I visualize with the three categories of workers' death, seen from the standpoint of the working class objects who are exploited at workplaces and experience multiple forms of dispossession in their living conditions through austerity measures and the commodification of the basic goods. The, the two processes are not only deeply connected, but mutually intensified. So the goal of the paper is to show, um, to show how Chebber Capital operates in both spheres. I mean, the big companies capital operates in production and reproduction spheres, exploiting labor and extracting the social capacity to reproduce. This a double process of a chevron led financialization makes the reproduction of working class lives almost impossible. I explained this death ridden growth pattern with the notion of progress by death. Further, I tracked the double penetration of a chevron finance into working class lives, that is, the subsumption of the spheres of production and reproduction under the chevron led financialization process as an example of the general tendency towards a financialization of social reproduction in the global regime of financial capitalism. So my main argument is twofold. The logic of a progress by debt is a regional strategy of the financialization of social reproduction that is in direct contradiction to working class social reproduction in contemporary South Korea. The logic of progress by debt as a constitutive element of a financial capitalism articulated in South Korea reproduces the uneven patterns of growth and the transnational relations of violence, debt, and dispossession in Asian economies. So that's my conclusion. I know it's, I really <laughs> don't know. I kind of, you know, condensed all the ideas in this short presentation. I just wanted to showcase what I'm really writing about these days. And I have two other book projects going on. The first was um, the title, Expressive Struggles, um, Neoliberal Temporalities and the Social Reproduction of Feminized Labor in South Korea. My dissertation project is now under contract with the press. Um, and I'm actually thinking about combining what I've said today, alternative unionism and social reproduction theory I'm thinking about in order it to be a unionism, we need to think about new visions, not only just strategy and tactics, right? So I'm thinking about writing my second book on social reproduction unionism. Fantastic. Okay. Um, so we are uh, behind schedule, and I would like to get us on schedule, uh, and I would really like to make sure that um, two people have an opportunity to give their full presentations and we have a chance to discuss it. So uh, we're actually going to take a quick five-minute break, and then at four o'clock, uh, we are going to have Janelle, and then Dave, and then Craig responding to Janelle and Dave, and then we're going to have a conversation. Um, so that's how we're going to do that to try and get back on schedule. Um, I'm sorry we can't have more of a dialogue now, uh, but hopefully we have a reception right after this and we'll have a chance to talk. Um, so uh, give us about five minutes and then we'll get started again with Janelle Austin. Hey, um, I'm Janelle Austin. I'm a professor of political science at in about an hour, um, but I do want to make sure that uh, we give our two next speakers plenty of time. Uh, that is Janelle Austin and Dave Reagan. Um, I've introduced Janelle already. Um, 
She is the co-founder of the George Floyd Gold Memorial. She is the director of the Racial Agency Initiative. And uh, she is hopefully going to be a um, resident of the Center for Working Democracy this year. Um, the other person that we're gonna be hearing from in a minute is uh, Dave Reagan, who is the president of United Healthcare Workers West SEIU. Um, Dave and I have been friends for a very long time. Uh, so my wife and Dave have been friends for much longer. Um, um, but he has been a, a tremendous supporter of the center and uh, we try to be a supporter of um, UHW and its work. Um, and finally, uh, Craig Calhoun, who is also a long uh, time and dear friend, um, who will be uh, engaging in a discussion, an initial discussion with Janelle and Dave after they present. Um, um, so Craig is a university professor of social sciences here at Arizona State University. Um, and uh, he will be closing us out with Dave and Janelle. Um, so let me turn it over to uh, Janelle to get us started, Janelle. Hello, 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 everyone. Hello. Yeah, someone responded. Hey. hey. <laughs> Microphone. Oh, this is, this is, um, this is been a very interesting day for me, especially like watching like the flow state video and seeing like my brother and my sister yeah. and my brother's cooler on like the screen and my friends and my neighbors. Um, and it, it, it evokes a lot of emotion or when Ben was giving his presentation and, and under uh, riots, there was listed, like the definition, there was listed barricades. And I was like, huh, huh. <laughs> <laughs> like, all right. And so just really filtering this moment and opportunity uh, through the experience that um, I've had over the last year and a half has been um, a really enjoyable process. Um, but um, I, I bring greetings from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, I am a daughter, sister, I'm an auntie, um, I'm a neighbor, I'm a cousin. Um, I, um, and I like to root myself um, in my relationships with the people that I engage to make me who I am and to make me a better person. Um, but other things, I, I like cloud watching, um, cloud formations are the best. I believe that ice cream makes the world go round and cookies help it. Um, and I've traveled the world and I've seen many things. And there are some things that I wish that I could unsee, but I can't. Um, so instead, I have committed my life to the work of racial justice. Um, and I want to acknowledge the Salt River, Pima, Maricopa Indian community um, and thank their people for the generations of care and connection to the earth around us that they have done here. Uh, with that said, um, I'm going to bring all of who I am to the table today. What I have to offer is part protest, part uh, theological, uh, part imagination, um, and with a dash of poetry. Uh, hopefully, I will bring you along my journey of ideas gracefully. Um, now, to talk about the memorial um, to George Floyd and really the memorial to all stolen lives, um, there's only one appropriate starting point in my experience, and that is simply the statement, whereas the city killed a man. And that's how Justice Resolution 001, more commonly uh, known as the 24 Demands, begins. And that's how I begin. Um, it, is, it is how a refreshed global movement for justice began. It is not lost on me that I would not be speaking to any of you today if George Floyd were still alive or had died by some other means. So I say it again, whereas the city killed a man. It is not lost on me either that in Minnesota, North Carolina, Texas, New York, Florida, and other parts of the country, there are extended family members of George Floyd who remember and grieve differently than we do, whereas the city killed a man. Um, I'm also keenly aware that uh, it is Dakota land in Minnesota 
that holds the final breath of George Floyd, bearing witness to the final memories of his life, whereas the city killed a man. And then there are the memories that we, the people, hold. The trauma, the protest, the fight for justice, the grief, the pain, the hope, the processing, the fear, the unknown, and the love, whereas the city killed a man. The death of George Floyd was extremely political, and so is his memorial. Let's take a moment to, brief, to briefly walk through an overly simplified review of what happened in 2020. First, we lost Kobe Bryant uh, to a tragic death. Next, COVID-19 exploded and shut down standard social and cultural practices across the globe. We were standing in long lines for groceries, toilet paper became the new white gold. We could only go outside once a day for a walk. Uh, we could not hold our elders. We did not know who or what was safe. Third, during the early days of the pandemic, on February 23rd, 2020, Ahmaud Arbery was killed by a vigilante who decided that, um, that Ahmad that Ahmad's decision to run while black was unacceptable. He killed Ahmad in cold blood, gunshot to the abdomen after Ahmad attempted to defend himself with his bare hands. March 13th, 2020. Brianna Taylor was murdered in her bed by law enforcement in Louisville who served a no-knock warrant and killed her while she was sleeping in her own bed. Steve Taylor was murdered by the police on April 18th, 2020. Doug Lewis on May 1st, 2020, and Sean Reed on May 6th, 2020. The United States of America had widely demonstrated that unlike the rest of our social patterns, racism and modern lynchings would not be halted because of the pandemic. Then came May 25th, 2020. George Floyd was murdered in broad daylight by the Minneapolis Police Department. Unlike the stolen lives before his, he was not shot to death. He died a slow, agonizing death via suffocation as then De Officer Derek Chauvin kept his knee on his neck while bystanders and Mr. Floyd himself pleaded for mercy. In response to the death of George Floyd, Minneapolis burned and the world took to the streets to protest the ongoing death of black people in the United States by the hands of law enforcement with a uh, lack of accountability. People marched to ensure that the police officers responsible for the death of George Floyd would be arrested and charged. People marched because we were in pain. People marched because we could not take it anymore. The compound deaths were too much to bear. Our grief was greater than our bodies could hold. And that energy had to go somewhere, lest it kill us too. In Minneapolis, as people marched, they would find their way to the place where George Floyd took his last breath and laid down an offering. The kinds of offerings people brought varied from protest signs to letters, uh, spiritual crystals to painted rocks, cut flowers to potted plants, baby blankets to bassinets, bottles of alcohol to fresh fruit and more. However people decided to process their grief, they found a way to express themselves and their protest. After spending months on end with these offerings, I have come to call them creative expressions of pain and hope. And while I could spend days talking about the materiality of the memorial today, 
I am more interested in speaking with you about the politics of the memorial wrapped up in a singular question. What does love have to do with it? Years ago, I was asked to write a poem for a friend's wedding on the topic of love. At the time, I did not feel that I had an adequate grasp on what love is. So I interviewed several people across the country on their understanding of love. The most profound response uh, that is forever etched into my memory comes from my apartment complex neighbors who were in their 60s. I asked the wife, how did you know that your husband loved you? She paused and then replied, he remembered me. There is an intricate connection between memory and love. The things and the people we love, we remember or we hope to be remembered by. As one drives through any city in this country, you may find memorials here and there along the side of the road. Maybe there was a car accident and a loved one died. Maybe there was a shooting, or maybe a family pet was hit by a car and died. It is not uncommon to see these simple acts of love pop up across the country. Now, memory and love is not just a connection to death. We remember birthdays, anniversaries, or maybe we simply just remember that our partner is at home holding it down uh, when we are away. And we choose to demonstrate that remembrance through a gift, through an act of kindness or intentional words. Or maybe you've experienced the decline of a loved one with dementia and you know the pain of not being remembered. Love and memory are intricately, intricately connected in our human experience. Now, let's move this idea of the connection of love and memory from an interpersonal scale to a societal scale. Uh, according to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, uh, we're going to break this down just simply. To memorialize is to commemorate, to call to remembrance, to serve as a memorial of. We are no longer simply dealing with a memory that is created by primary experience per se. Now we're in the realm of creating memory through storytelling. We shape the collective memory through the ways by which we tell history. I know and love and remember Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Not because I met him personally and shared memories together, though I wish we did. Uh, I know and love and remember him because he is in my textbooks in school. His name is on at least one major thoroughfare in nearly every major city. He has a national holiday named after him in January. He has a monument in Washington, DC. He is loved as a civil rights movement hero because of the way in which the story is remembered and because the story is remembered. Dr. King has been memorialized into the conscience of American society as someone to be loved, whether or not you agree or disagree with how or if he should be remembered. In this work of racial justice, I like to say that it is extremely important uh, that we hold a PBS Kids imagination. And for those of you who share my love for Sesame Street, um, do you remember this exercise? One of these things is not like the other. One of these things just doesn't belong. Can you tell which one is not like the other uh, before I finish this song? but I'm not gonna sing it because I know my limitations and my gifts. And here are the names, Christopher Columbus, Robert E. Lee, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., George Perry Floyd. Here's what they have in common. All of them are remembered. All of them are deceased. All of them are men. 
all of them had flaws. All of them have streets named after them somewhere in this country. All of them had statues and mission to remember them. All of them lived in different time periods from each other. But like a classic PBS kids exercise, there is an obvious answer and it's George Perry Floyd. What did George Floyd do for society to be remembered by society? Last summer, many people across the country were outspoken about not lifting up the name of George Floyd because he is not a hero. He is not a martyr. He's not someone they would want to teach their children and grandchildren about. He is not worthy of our collective remembrance and love. And this begs the question, well, who is? And who gets to decide who is remembered and to what end? Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean, came to a shore that was new to him and initiated an era that would be filled with centuries of genocide and slavery. He is hailed in white American history as a hero, while in indigenous circles, he is a historical villain. Robert E. Lee was a general for the Confederate Army, and he is hailed in white Southern American history as a hero, and he was on the side that lost the war in an attempt to, to secede from the country. As a Black person, why would society force me to remember a man who wanted to keep me enslaved for the capitalistic ventures of the South? Martin Luther King was a powerful thought contributor, contributor to reshaping the moral and ethical fabric of America. In his final days, he was mobilizing a poor people's campaign and advocating for sanitation workers. But he is broadly remembered for his eloquent rhetoric of, I have a dream, at the tail end of his speech at the March on Washington. America has shaped the narrative of Dr. King in a way that empties his words and actions of their power. Yet all these men are memorialized by our country to shape the story of who and how we are to remember and love. George Floyd is not supposed to be one of them because George Floyd was not selected by whiteness to be remembered to sustain systems of racial oppression. The memorialization of George Floyd exists as the intersection of the demand for love and justice as a form of protest to systemic injustice. In his work, Where Do We Go From Here? Dr. Martin Luther King writes, what is needed is a realization that power without love is reckless and abusive and that love without power is sentimental and anemic. Power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice. Justice at its best is love correcting everything that stands against love. So what happened? In a social context where COVID-19 was killing people and disproportionately black and brown people, black people across the country were still being killed by police and vigilantes. In his book, Long Time Coming, Reckoning with Race in America, Michael Eric Dyson uses a rhetorical tool of writing to the late Emmett Till, describing the way in which these twin pandemics of racism and COVID-19 are shaping the experience of Black death in a way that is too heavy for any of us to bear. It is out of this context the people protested. We have a sign at George Floyd Square that reads, where there's people, there's power. The people decided that the story of George Floyd would be remembered. The people decided that they would love a stranger who is dead because he represents so many who can and might die 
the same way if something does not change. We centered his story despite who he is, to, sorry, despite who he was and what he did or did not do. We took someone who was socially marginalized and centered him in our collective consciousness. On seven continents, and I know this because I met someone from Antarctica who came to me and said, we protested. <laughs> <All right. laughs> uh, on seven continents, the people protested against unjust systems. And in Minneapolis, an organic memorial composed as a mosaic of thousands of offerings in protest to stolen lives was erected by the people. George Floyd's name has become a symbol of how society can center and love marginalized people suffering from unjust systems. And though this process of constant remembrance and through this process of constant remembrance, we place pressure on political systems to do justice. How? Did I mention that the memorial has shut down a major intersection for one year, three months, and one day? Where we remember is critical to the pressure that it's placed on the government to pay attention. Where we remember. In our book, Exhibiting Atrocity, Memorial Museums and the Politics of Past Violence, Amy Sodaro tells us that there are three primary roles of museums. Um, in her words, the first is what we consider their museum function. That is their role as a mechanism of truth telling about history and preserving the past. In this sense, they aspire to be houses of history where the past is uncovered, documented and preserved and the truth about what has happened is revealed to their visitors. The second is what, we, is what we can consider their memorial function, which is to serve as a space of healing and repair. In this, they are a form of symbolic reparation that seeks to give acknowledgement to the victims and serve as a solemn space of mourning and remembrance in effort to help heal and repair communities. The final function embodies that what is most new and unique about these museums and is the very reason that this hybrid form has emerged. They are intended to morally educate visitors to internalize an ethic of never again. While George Floyd Square is not yet a memorial museum, but a place of pilgrimage and protest, it holds a similar function. And the never again sentiment is the element of protest. Memorials, when we are intentional, can be disruptive structures of love that move people to change systems that unjustly kill people. But they have to be big enough and profound enough to force people and governments to pay attention. I like to define protests as something that exists to disrupt business as usual, to signal that there is something wrong that needs to be made right. And this is where this movement links to the work of the Center for Work and Democracy for me. For the people to take a stand to protest Black death through racist government institutions is for the people simultaneously to stand up for black life. Black life is the sum of a mosaic of experiences, which includes the basic human right and need to work. As a, theolo as a theologian, my studies of the Christian scriptures have brought me to the conclusion that people were created to work and work is a gift from God to fulfill our identity as being human without being exploited. To advocate for the liberation of black life is to open the door for building equity for all people in America and to embrace what, is, uh, what it means to be fully human. The activism work of racial justice includes the advocacy for workers' rights. Just think how many more black people would have survived the pandemic if they were 
not considered essential workers and forced by their economic circumstances to show up to work every day, increasing their chances of being exposed to unknown uh, to an unknown virus without the proper PPE and return home every day, placing their families at that same risk. Justice is the process of making things right. Our work as racial justice activists is to not just right the wrong of policing in America. It is to right the wrong of racism. And we have chosen to lead this fight with love through the process of memorialization until we as a society never forget and, um, and choose to chart a different path forward. In closing, I want to tell you a story. On July 24th, 2021, a young black family visited George Floyd Square at about 11 p.m. at night. It was a mother with three sons. The oldest was about 16 years old and the youngest was 10. It was his birthday. And he was just old enough to ask a million questions. He asked about the fists in the center of the intersection. He asked about the offerings that were laid in the street. He asked about the photos he saw in the windows. It was a time of night where nothing was happening. Just a few neighbors were out being present under the night sky. Suddenly, the young child exclaimed, this place is more amazing than I expected. I looked at him and I asked him, why? He replied, there is so much love here. It was a child without the aesthetic of protests, musicians, or activities, or the hustle that George Floyd Square can bring on any given day, who when left to discern what the essence of the memorial is that came to the conclusion of love. We must be doing something right there. The memorial at the intersection of George Floyd Square was built from love and grief as a form of protest to the government for killing a black man without regard for black life. The people established a memorial like one we have never seen before to reshape history and the decision-making process of choosing who gets to be remembered and for what reasons. This reshaping of historical imagination will impact our collective way of living, loving, and remembering. George Floyd is neither a hero nor a martyr. George Floyd is us and we are George Floyd. As a Black person in America, the only thing that separates me from suffering the same fate of unjust Black death as George Floyd is a police officer having a rough day and deciding to take it out on me. The line is extremely thin. Therefore, it is urgent that we allow this and other memorials to be large enough to disrupt and challenge systems of injustice to let people in places of government power know that we are not collateral damage to a system of white supremacy, to remind them that those who have died unjustly are remembered and loved and upheld as stolen lives. And the more we collectively lean in as a society to memorialize those who have died unjustly, we will not only place pressure on existing systems to be corrected, but we shape the course of American history, remembering and loving people because they are people deserving of holistic liberty and justice and hope. For at the end of the day, the people are more sacred than the memorial itself and worthy of our love and worthy of the chance to live fully. Thank you. Thank you.
hear from our last uh, speaker today, Dave Reagan, um, president of uh, United Health Care Workers West, SEIU. Um, we're trying to get him up on the screen. He's coming in remotely. There he is. Okay. Hi, Michael. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Michael? Okay. Hello? No. He's unmuted on my end, but on his own, he's on his own. There's no icon for him to use. Oh, uh -huh. Wow, good eye. <laughs> Thank you so much. Hey, can you hear me, Michael? Yes, it is. Thank you. Okay. Not clear. All right. I wasn't sure that that was going to work. Um, well, listen, I, first of all, I, I just want to thank everybody who's participated and contributed to the conference today. Um, you know, all of the, the fellows and the presenters and Michael and, you know, the whole group at the Center for Work and Democracy. And I also want to appreciate Janelle and, and her comments. Um, and, you know, given that we're at the tail end of the day, um, you know, I'll do the best I can to try to be succinct. And what I'm hoping to do is to just offer a set of thoughts. Um, you know, the official topic that I've been asked to uh, speak to is, um, you know, the renewal of, of labor in America and what its prospects are. And, you know, honestly, this is a, a difficult and complicated and uh, thorny question, and I'm not going to pretend to try to give any definitive explanation here, but I do think there's a set of things that I hope to put on the table that speak to the possibilities in the future, the work of the Center for Work and Democracy, and, and just what all of us do in our capacity, whether in academia or doing social justice work or doing, you know, the kind of union work um, that I do with my coworkers and colleagues at United Healthcare Workers West. Um, let me just say, uh, I want to start, um, you know, just with a little bit of context. And the first thing I should say is that our organization, which is based in California, is a, a local union of a little more than 100,000 hospital workers. Uh, the membership of uh, United Healthcare Workers West uh, is about 70% women. It is majority people of color. Um, most of our members uh, are neither doctors nor registered nurses. They work in what are called the allied healthcare professions. Uh, the typical member of our organization makes about $60,000 a year, has fully paid family health care. Uh, and has an organization that is taking very seriously the question of how do we get every single member of SEIU United Healthcare Workers West to retirement, as we like to say, with all of their stuff. Uh, and anybody who's paying even a little bit of attention in the world these days knows that, you know, the standard of living for, uh, for service workers and for you know, frontline healthcare workers is something that is precarious. Um, most workers in America today uh, have a stagnant or declining uh, standard of living, which is the product of lots of different factors. Uh, the first thing I just want to remind everybody of is that organized labor, going back to some of the comments that June made earlier today, reached its high point in terms of the number of workers represented by unions in the United States in the mid 1950s. Um, organized labor in America has been in steady decline for almost 70 years, unabated decline. Uh, and I think, I certainly believe that that's resulted in all kinds of economic and social dislocation, uh, again, born of just a steadily eroding uh, you know, real standard of living for the vast majority of American wage earners. Um, 
one of the things that's just real if you do union work uh, anywhere in America is that unions and workers just don't win enough. Um, and we are trying to think about in, in conjunction with the Center for Work and Democracy is how do we think about winning? How can we imagine winning? How do we start expecting to win? Um, and how do we you know, really prepare ourselves, not just to struggle, not just to fight, not just to try, not just to resist, but to actually succeed. And I would suggest to everybody that this sort of general mindset in American labor um, it is a real issue and something we have to think about how to overcome, which is how do we win? How do we create the conditions to win? And not just win at the margins, but hopefully to win on scale. In her presentation earlier today, June talked about this basic formulation that there's about, you know, somewhere between 10 and 12% of American wage earners are members of labor unions, um, which obviously means in round numbers, 10%, you know, have union representation, 90% don't. And all of us understand from a common sense perspective that it is very, very difficult to set standards generally if you're trying to do that from a base of 10% flying in the face of this ocean of 90% non-unionism. And it's fair to think about that, the 10% versus 90%, but the truth is what that obscures is radically different levels of representation between the public and the private sectors. And again, as June laid out, over a third of public employees are members of unions, but only about 6% of private sector workers in America, one out of 16 people who go to work every day for private capital are members of unions. And it is the private sector that drives economic standards in this country. And if we don't think and come up with ways to deal with that, our prospects going forward um, really are bleak. So for us in UHW, and I think for us at the Center for Work and Democracy is we really do have to think about how do we attack this problem of declining and almost disappearing unionism, particularly in the private sector, increasing public hostility towards public employee union members and what they have managed to hang on to that has largely been lost in the private sector, like defined benefit pension plans. You know, we need new strategies. We need new approaches. We have to think about different ways um, to get at that. And the truth is what you see in America right now is that American labor is almost in this balkanized state where most union members, even within that framework that I described a moment ago, are housed in a handful of states, particularly California, Oregon, Washington, Illinois, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Michigan. The great majority of union members are in those eight or so states. And outside of those eight or so states, it's just you know wholesale non-unionism that is ascendant uh, and that basically sets the terms for what's going on uh, across the country. Um, one thing I just want to put on the table, and there's been a lot of discussion lately, and I'm sure people in this conversation are following it, about um, the PRO Act. It got mentioned earlier today. There's a lot of commentary in, you know, in the news about this resurgence of labor and that President Biden is going to be the new FDR. And I think, I think we really ought to pump the brakes on that. And... <laughs> And I say that, you know, we certainly believe in UHW and we are very active politically. And I'm going to talk about a, a couple of things regarding that in a moment. But what is true and what we need to start being more honest in, about is that the Democratic Party in America has now been captured by corporate money and corporate influence. It, it is not a party that is in any meaningful way a workers' party. It does not speak fundamentally to the issues of working class people in an economic sense. The Democratic Party is better on a set of socially progressive issues, you know, including you know, racial issues, gender issues, 
um, choice issues, those sorts of things. But when you get down to raw brass knuckle contests between private capital and workers, wage earners about money, about their standard of living, um, I don't think we do ourselves any services by thinking that salvation lies uh, in the Democratic Party. And I think that's an issue that we have to be more frank about. I think it's a legitimate criticism of institutional organized labor that we have put an enormous amount of hope uh, and expectation in the ability of President Biden and these you know, razor thin Democratic majorities uh, to do things that really you know, amount to trillions of dollars of reallocated costs between private capital and regular people. And I think we, you know, we should be thoughtful, mindful, have our eyes open about that. Um, I say that because I think it's largely true um, that we are searching you know, for strategies inside of organized labor. And I don't have time to unpack all of this today, but I think if you look at what organized labor is saying today, it is disproportionately hitched you know, our hopes for whatever you might call a resurgence or a renewal is disproportionately tied to gains in the public sector, um, pressing on elected Democrats in those handful of states to do things to increase unionism and union representation among public employees. Um, but we really don't have strategies around private sector employees. And that is the thing we have to do. You know, California, which is viewed as this outlier of, you know, democratic hegemony and democratic governor and super majorities in the legislature, when push came to shove yeah. about a contest between workers and the classification of workers as employees or contractors at Uber and Lyft, you know, versus, uh, you know, that workforce versus the owners of those platform companies in Silicon Valley more generally, we got wiped out. Um, and, you know, we're, I think it's an open question about whether or not and the role that elected Democrats are prepared to play. So one more little bit of context, and then I want to just put some things on the table for how we think about this and, and what we think matters and hopefully some of the things that the center can focus on in the morning or in the morning, in the future. Um, a couple of quick things. The American workforce is about 160 million people. If you aggregate all of the membership figures of every union in America, you get about 16 million people, roughly 10%. I think that's a good back of the envelope number. That's all unions. And I say that because if we're going to have a renewal, if we're going to have a resurgence, if workers are going to turn around the declining standard, the real declining standard of living that we're facing, we can't be doing things in the hundreds or the thousands or even the tens of thousands. We have to have strategies that reach people into the millions. And we have to be willing to experiment. We have to be willing to take risks. We have to be willing to put resources on the table for things that may be uncomfortable, counterintuitive, you know, may even seem somewhat speculative. But our, you know, our position is precarious and incrementalism is not the way out of this situation. And I think you look no further than just this torrent of wealth that has surged upwards during the pandemic itself you know, which is really, again, just the, the very, very top, not the top 1%, the top, you know, one one hundredth of 1% billionaires that have seen their wealth increase by trillions of dollars literally during this pandemic. You can't combat that with incremental, small ball, non-scaled approaches because those things really do drive the economy. I don't wanna talk a lot about it, but it was a little discouraging to me about how much attention the Amazon election in Bessemer, Alabama got. Yeah. I think those of us that have done this work for a long time did not expect that the union was gonna prevail. And even if they had prevailed, organizing 14 or 1500 warehouse workers 
or a few thousand warehouse workers in the middle of Alabama against this behemoth called Amazon, you know, winning an election is a very, very fleeting and temporary sort of victory, even if you can achieve it. And I think that, you know, we need to, you know, take stock and learn some lessons and think about it. And what I'm trying to say is the legal vehicle that we use and we talk most about to increase unionism is the National Labor Relations Act, which is a piece of legislation that's 90 years old. And it was built for an economy that doesn't exist anymore. And I just think it's not, you don't have to be very creative to think that if we're trying to funnel whatever creativity and strategies and ideas we have through this anachronistic and 90 year old piece of legislation, you, you got to again, pump the brakes and ask yourself if you're doing the right thing. So I think we need to take scale seriously. I just want to say again, we're a local union of 100,000 members, and I just want to share with you some of the work we're doing, not because, you know, just because this is what we are doing, and this is what we are thinking about, and this is how, you know, we tinker with what I just described is confronting us. And there's a, you know, a set of core principles. Number one, we don't have a lot of time. We're facing a dire and an urgent situation to get people to retirement with all of their stuff. And even better, how do we create the conditions for people actually to have an improved, uh, improving standard of living? Um, you know, Michael and others at the center are familiar with this, that one of our experiments is we created an organization called the Fairness Project. Um, we created it five years ago. We launched it with a set of campaigns in 2016, including putting on the ballot in the state of Arizona that we wanted to raise the minimum wage, which at that time was $8.05 an hour to $12 an hour. And on the night Donald Trump got elected and carried the state of Arizona in 2016, those same voters voted by a 60-40 margin to increase the minimum wage in Arizona for all private sector workers from $8.05 an hour to $12 an hour, index it to inflation, and also had a companion piece about earned sick days that was part of that. And that to us was striking. That provided direct significant wage increases to 800,000 Arizonans. It provided direct earned benefit, um, you know, benefits to over 900,000 Arizonans. And today the minimum wage is $12 an hour. And if you're a full-time worker making minimum wage and there are plenty of people out there doing it, you're making $8,000 a year more now than you were in 2016. It's just about scale. It's just about opportunities. It's just about looking for discontinuities but it takes resources. Um, and the resources to do that campaign, you know, came from a union with 100,000 members in the state of California that was willing to take a flyer and try an experiment. In five years, we've run 21 campaigns, state level ballot initiatives across the country to raise the minimum wage, to expand healthcare benefits through Medicaid expansion, to do some payday loan type stuff, reform. Uh, we won 20 of those campaigns out of 21. Uh, most recently, we won uh, Medicaid expansion in Missouri and Oklahoma. We've also won in Idaho, in Utah, in Nebraska, in Maine, in Massachusetts, in Washington State, and San Antonio. The point I'm trying to make is that, you know, we need to be able to look for opportunities to win. And in those 20 campaigns that we won, this is literally the case. Over 17 million individual human beings have won higher wages, health care benefits, sick day benefits, or other types of reforms that directly improve their standard of living. The total cost of those 20 campaigns was about $65 million. And when the minimum wage is fully implemented, for instance, next year in California, we're gonna to go to $15 an hour. We're at 14 right now. The annual value 
to working class and poor people of those 20 victories costing $65 million is going to be $25 billion a year in perpetuity. It's something resources matter, scale matters, people need to win more. And so this is the kind of thing June might call it alternative unionism, but it's not collective bargaining, it's direct political activity to try to do what is so difficult to be done these days, look no further than Amazon, look no further than how few strikes there are in America, look no further than how little union organizing is going on. And the reason for that is because the decisive factor about whether or not workers can get unions right now under the National Labor Relations Act, the key variable is employer opposition. And if the employer is willing to go to the mat and do the kinds of things that Amazon was clearly willing to do and do the kinds of things that all kinds of private sector employers around the country are willing to do, it is really, really hard for workers to win. It's not a fair fight. It's like marching headlong into machine gun fire and just saying, well, you know, the victory is in the trying or the victory mm -hmm. is in the resistance when in fact, what the victory needs to be is real material improvements in people's lives. Okay. And so I just wanna, you know, make the case that when you think about the return and this is a business term, but I think it's appropriate $25 billion a year forever based on one-time costs of $65 million, those are better returns than if you invested in Google at its inception. Workers can win in this country. Workers can win at scale, but we have to be willing to be unorthodox. We have to be willing to do things differently. We need more of an ecosystem that includes organizations and entities like the Center for Work and Democracy. We need more connections between these sorts of battles and what goes on in George Floyd Square and other people and other places across the country, but we can't be Pollyannish about it. If you wanna take on private capital in America, you better be prepared with resources. You better be prepared to act on scale. You better be prepared to do things that maybe are a little bit uncomfortable. And, and we need to do all that electoral work with the Democratic candidates and Democratic officials, but we got too many eggs in that basket and we need to be, again, to use a business word, more entrepreneurial, more you know, uh, comfortable with risk and all those kinds of things. Final points that I would make is that, you know, I, I do think what June said in her uh, comments and presentation was that a lot of what's going on in the alternative union space, that's where she found a lot of creativity. I would just say that's another way of saying those are spaces where employers can't fight back the way they can fight back in a contained environment like we found at Amazon. That we have to come at this you know, not running at the machine gun fire, but how do we find opportunities where it's not such a rigged game, it's not such an unfair fight, where you've got asymmetric, you know, competition or asymmetric types of battles. So I think all of that makes sense. And again, I think the Center for Work and Democracy can play a role there. The last thing I wanna say is that, um, you know, I'm hopeful and the reason we at UHW are interested in the Center of Work and Democracy is because we think we gotta have more activity. We're not gonna succeed in this world of making changes in people's lives with very dire consequences and a really you know, overwhelming set of conditions that we're facing unless we have more and more activity and more and more activity at scale. And I just think Arizona is one of the best laboratories in America. It's a state that's changing. The demo, you know, I'm not a believer in demographics or destiny, but what is happening in the state of Arizona in the emerging Latino population and lots of young people with a different history of political involvement and struggle and awareness and all of that, I just think it's a it's a really rich environment and it should lend itself towards thinking about things, you know like non-collective bargaining strategies, like building mass popular organizations. Um, 
uh, one of the things we're doing, we've created an organization in Arizona called Healthcare Rising Arizona. We're in the process of qualifying for next year's ballot in Arizona, uh, a measure that would reform the way consumer and medical debt is handled in that state. We're built, we will have 2,000 dues paying members by this time next year of people who are struggling with us for that. Again, with a sense that change can be made, with a sense that it can be done at scale. Uh, and we're looking forward just to the opportunity to continue to learn and work and struggle with everybody. Um, you know, Because we are, despite everything in front of us, eternal optimists. We think we can win. We wanna be there to win with you. And we appreciate your time and your consideration and looking forward to doing lots of good stuff together. So thanks very much. Thank you, Dave. Um, Craig, would you like to come up and uh, give some response uh, or discussion with Janelle and uh, Dave? If no one minds, I'm going to take my mask off and be a little more clearly audible. I want to ask a few questions. I wish we had hours to ask more questions. Um, really different styles of presentation that are both compelling and important. So I think we need to um, identify common denominators, but also some different messages. And let me begin with the common denominator that was one of Dave's last points, optimism. Janelle talked earlier about the importance in George Floyd Square of creative expressions of pain and hope, of the idea that hope was crucial. Um, there wasn't a lot of, oh, we're optimistic because we look around us and see the way Black people are treated in America, right? This was reaching beyond how Black people are currently treated in America to identify resources for hope, identifying them in part in love in the really powerful presentation that Janelle gave us. And Dave was not painting a happy picture about the state of workers in America and saying, well, we can look at the recent trends in unionization and that gives us cause for hope. He was saying we need to confront these things with optimism, and we can identify good reasons to be optimistic based on possible new courses of action, based on ideas, not simple descriptions of reality. And I wanna connect what Chanel said and Dave said, love, right? Based on solidarity, based on commitment to each other, based on a willingness to work together, but also based on ideas about how we can work together. And something that wasn't completely explicit in Janelle's speech, except for in one or two words, but is really a powerful part of the George Floyd Square uh, memorial that she's helped to lead is the creativity of it. That it is not just one more iteration of a kind of action that has been repeated over and over again. Oh, let's go do that. That's useful. Certainly it drew on knowledge of other kinds of commemorations that had gone before and other kinds of protests, but it was a creative effort to move outside the box of standard responses to violent murder by public officials by police of Black people in America. And I think this is what Dave is calling for, and I think it's what the Center for Work and Democracy is committed to, identifying paths to make a difference, including new ideas about how people can work together, and finding from these new ideas some bases for optimism, some bases for actually being committed to work together because we believe that life can be better. Now I'm gonna say just one more thing. Um, this isn't just about everything in life. 
This is about making democracy work by recognizing the centrality of workers to who the people are in a democracy and making democracy work by recognizing the centrality of black Americans and Americans of a variety of different racialized identities of different immigrant statuses of the native American populations of the country right, are also a lot of the population, the citizens, right? Blacks, women, indigenous populations, white men without property were all disenfranchised by the initial constitution. All have won greater rights over time. None have won full rights over time. The struggles have not succeeded in producing full democracy in America. Democracy remains a set of ideals that we hope we can live up to better in the future than we do right now. And the we is really important. Being able to say we right, is constantly opposed by dominant forces in the media, by dominant forces in our politics, right? We, the workers in solidarity with each other, we, even all Black Americans, even all those who care about the memory of George Floyd, it's hard to get the we all together, let alone to then extend it across lines of race um, and other divisions in the country. But it's not an accident that we're talking about work and democracy. Because of the centrality of work to constitute our lives together, and the potential for that we. And because democracy is basic to the hope that we can actually make a better society. And this is concrete and straightforward in proposals like many that Dave is not just making now, but has pursued effectively in the past. Use the political process to achieve gains that cannot be achieved by other tactics. Reach outside the box of usual tactics when using the political process. It connects to struggles for racial justice in the United States as well. Voting rights, for example, is a combined Black and Union issue in this country. Voter suppression is the suppression of votes that are needed by both Black people and all the union people that we can think of. And with that, workers are not some stereotype, right? just the worker, we know what a worker is. We know what one looks like because we've seen Archie Bunker on TV or something like that, right? Workers are single moms, young black men, retired people who need income beyond their social security, parents trying to care for children and their own parents at once, immigrants losing benefits because they're undocumented, or because they're afraid to make demands that they should make. School teachers, healthcare workers in dozens of different specific occupations. Right? Workers are all of these things and black people are all of these things too. Right? Everything on that list. So there's gotta be potential solidarity. The issue of voting rights calls our attention to it because if there is successful voter suppression, it undermines right, all of the actions that can benefit all of us. But the actions go beyond just voting in a lot of different ways. I'm gonna stop talking now. We're running late on time, but I want to pose a couple of questions just to hear again from our inspiring speakers. First, I want to pose a question to Janelle, though it may be one that Dave wants to weigh in on too. I love the way that Janelle repeated today and everyone in the square has repeated for the whole period of the occupation. Whereas the city killed a man. Now there's lots that's resonant in that phrase. One feature 
is an idea of collective responsibility. That is, refusing to say this is just the misconduct of one officer. The city killed a man, which calls our attention to how the city exists. It exists as socially organized action. It maintains and constitutes the city. There are a whole set of processes. There are elections to city council. There's a budget. There's taxation, right? There's an apparatus to the city, right? But here comes my, my question, right? Can the city be held accountable without transforming what the city is? Can the city be held accountable? Made to answer to collective responsibility without transforming what the city is in a basic sense. And I mean that where the city is both Minneapolis, but also more metaphorically, right? A social organization we live. I'm hoping for more than a yes or no answer. <laughs> <laughs> you do not frame it as such, so I have an out. Um, <laughs> um, you know, it was so fascinating over this past year, like uh, I, I would have politicians respond and say, well, Janelle, the city is the people, the city is all of us, right? Um, knowing good and well that the city is also this, this compilation of um, systems and structures um, that exist to protect them itself um, and the way that our political, system, political systems are shaped and formed. Um, no. I, I think I think the, the accountability requires transformation change, right? Because again, protests exist to disrupt business as usual, to signal that there is something wrong. If business as usual in the context of the city government, the city systems, the city processes, um, the, the city infrastructure is oppressive then there has to be some kind of transformation for it to no longer oppress citizens. So for example, when people often talk about this concept of safety, that has been the trigger word for this last year. Who's safe? Can we be safe? Um, oftentimes they are not referring to uh, Joe, who is a, a black man in our community. I'm so glad his name is Joe. <laughs> who's a black man in our community um, who has lived a challenging life, who has done time, who has felonies, um, but um, is also doing the work to change not only the way in which that he lives out the rest of his life, but also make it better for the youth in the community. He has a past, but he also sees a better future for himself. However, the way the, the system works within the city, um, Joe is just a black man who makes white people feel unsafe because of his tattoos, <laughs> right? Because of his dark skin, because of his posture, because of the way he speaks and moves. Um, so if, if the city doesn't change the way in which it allows systems to perpetuate uh, racialized stereotypes um, and racialized oppression and, and racialized ideas in the minds of residents, right? Um, we will continue to see more lynchings. That makes sense to me. I, I agree, but I want to push back and ask sure. one more question, which is you say this encourages white citizens in oh, Minneapolis. I do. But blacks too, right? And I'm thinking of things like the New York mayoral election, okay. where we saw the security issue mobilizing um, not only white votes against progressive white candidates, um, but um, being used to mobilize black as well as white citizens on a security issue towards a pro police campaign um that seemed at odds with the protests of only six or eight months before 
So whiteness is an ideology, and you don't have to be white right. to be white. Okay. <laughs> I will I will buy that. I'll say it's the ideology <laughs> that that, and I I mean I think that's the right answer. Mm -hmm. Is it also an ideology that fits in alongside other things? So it's not just the ideology of whiteness here. That there's an ideology of safety and security, and there's mm -hmm. an ideology of um um prosperity uh, and ide ideology of property, right? So there are people, oh, well, you know, I own a house, so I'm in a different position from those other people. And that we have trouble thinking all of these together at the same time. And we tend to get distracted by one at a time. Yeah, and I mean, I would even say that like those other ideologies even flow out of the constructs of whiteness that have been built over centuries and, and in this country, right? Because when you're dealing with the constructs of racism um, in America, it's deeply tied to capitalism, right? Like black bodies, free labor, make a lot yeah. of money. And then all of a sudden you're trying to protect your property. All of a sudden you're trying to uh, figure out how do you keep me in minds? Like all, like all of those things have evolved and those ideas have evolved um, in the pursuit of more wealth and then protecting my wealth and protecting and making sure that it only goes a certain direction, maybe to my kids, um, or maybe not my kids if I don't like them. <laughs> but but this, this pursuit of Dr. Um, Willie Jennings at Yale, he talks about whiteness as this idea of um, becoming a self-sufficient white male. Um, and in, in that pursuit, well, what does it take for me to do that? that I have to secure my stuff. Mm -hmm. I have, I need police to protect my property. I need, um, or to, to protect my own body, to make me feel safe against whatever makes me, will keep me from achieving this I idea of becoming a self-sufficient white male. So I, yeah, so I think those idea, ideas are real as well, um, but because of the, uh, the work that I do with understanding race theory, I would say that those things flow out of the constructs of race that we've created um, in America. Okay. Can, yeah. Can I can I offer something here? And it's I, mean, I, I know these are are deep and complicated issues. I, I you know again this what we think a lot about in our organization is how do we as unionized healthcare workers who have a broad array of interests, right? Where, you, where the base is your workplace and your work life, but obviously that's a piece of who people are. And I mentioned the, you know, the work we've done through the Fairness Project. I just wanna share with people that in November in the city of Cleveland, uh, voters will have an opportunity to vote on a measure to take oversight and accountability for police misconduct out of the hands of the police department and place it with a citizens organization. Um, this is just, this is something where we've worked with activists and people in Cleveland, including, you know, the family of Tamir Rice uh, and others. Um, and again, the fundamental observation we have is that the people the people broadly, expansively, messily, will frequently do more and go further than their elected representatives. And so to the best of our knowledge, the real, you know, the, the most significant police reform measure um, that's on the table in a major American city is something, you know, we've put there by citizen referendum and ballot initiative and we believe we're gonna win. Um, we believe that the public at large in Cleveland is ahead of where elected officials are. And again, there are opportunities um, and it's it's just, a, you know, we've done minimum wage, we've done Medicaid expansion, we're looking at these sorts of issues and we're in active discussions with activists and groups around the country you know, in a in about ten or twelve major cities, because we just think it's it's not the whole or the totality, but it's one piece of what we can do 
Um, and so I, and by the way, right, the campaign is called Citizens for a Safer Cleveland. <laughs> but underneath, <laughs> underneath that headline is something that is really, you know, we think, you know, ahead of the curve in terms of what's going on in this space. And I'd encourage people, if you're interested, there's a website, there's all of that, and keep your eyes posted for what happens in Cleveland on election day. But Dave, let me stick with you for a moment and, and ask, um, and thanks for that about Cleveland. The, what you're talking about in Cleveland is in general, the sort of wager that we all place on democracy, right? Ultimately, the people. And elected officials vary from representing the people more to representing the people not at all and a variety of constraints get in there to do it. So if it takes millions of dollars to raise a campaign, then the rich um, have way more clout and so forth. So um, you've pointed, and I just wanna underscore it, to the extent to which the party system seems broken as far as giving the people voice. Am I fairly summarizing that? I think that's fair. Okay, and I wanna ask about the courts because we have in the country also in place these other um, systems like the judiciary system, the legal system, in principle and sometimes protecting our democratic rights, not always. And courts have been an, um, you know, an obstacle to a number of um, uh, popular, um, worker-oriented uh, ballot initiatives. Do you think that we have to also be waging a fight to change the judiciary um, in order to have more success? You know, you're asking me that question from the middle of the state of Arizona. And, <laughs> uh, I know where I speak. Yeah, and I, you know, and we've been on the business end of you know, some of these purely political and ideological uh, decisions. So I, you know, I think obviously the answer is yes. Um, and, you know, none of these things are, you know, are perfect and flawless and all of that. The core contention and the core observation we would make in UHW and in some of these experiments we've done is that there are more opportunities, flawed as they may be, if we look for, you know, as a workers organization, if we look, you know, to citizen initiated referendums or ballot initiatives, if we look to legal strategies, those sorts of things, um, you know, the state courts in Arizona are abysmal and the state Supreme Court is an enormous problem. The federal courts, you know, the, the that this is the genius, the evil genius of Mitch McConnell and what they've done to the, the federal judiciary. But having said that, you know, it's still, when you think about the systems we're confronting, capital, systemic racism, all of that, as flawed as it might be, you know, the voters in the courts are a better wager <laughs> than representative government, in my view, that will, you know, and we ought to contest every area of terrain, but we ought to do it with our eyes open. Um, and I think a state like Arizona, and it, I'm trying to do this from memory, I can't recall, I, I believe your state Supreme Court is appointed, not elected. Um, I could be wrong about that, but I, I think the state judiciary in Arizona, you know, the federal judiciary is just a whole different kettle of fish and it's hard to get at that, but we can do something about the state judiciary. And I think, you know, in Arizona in particular, there's a premium on that. That makes sense. One of the features of, of our situation is time back to Janelle's points where she said, how much flows from whiteness. There's a lot that flows from capitalism. And these sort of converge. We've never had capitalism except in the form of racialized capitalism, right? So there is no other variety. 
um, back to slavery, back to the whole history of it. Have we had um, institutions or settings or spaces that give us more hope about um, gaining leverage um, against that? So I have, I, you know, are, have there been the union? We haven't had a union movement that hasn't been racialized either, but we've had examples of unions that did extraordinary work overcoming some of the racial divisions that capitalism promotes. We've had examples of social movements. The, you mentioned um, the Poor People's Campaign that Martin Luther King was organized when, organizing when he was murdered, which was linked to the freedom budget of Bayard Rustin and to a whole broad campaign that was designed to at once reflect the racially based civil rights movement and transcend it, right? So do we, is part of what gives us hope some things like this? I feel like those examples, um, they were expose more so the feelings of hopelessness because we live in a country <laughs> we, we live in a country that the moment people try to start moving us in a different direction they kill us right <laughs> um, or they they find a way to stop it or defund it or <coughs> curb it or silence it so that people don't pay attention to it um and i and i think that is our ever existing challenge as a people and that is why collective movements are so necessary because we need to be able to have a critical mass of people but it can't just be for like a, a spot on the the annual calendar like it can't be like okay two weeks i got my protest out i'm going home right <laughs> um we have to be able to to offer our lives up for a sustainable commitment to change. Um, I like to say that justice is a way of life. And, um, and I think what gives me hope more so is it, right now is the youth and the younger generation in which um, they are willing to go without to see somebody else actually have a chance at life and living. Um, and I hope that that's not washed away um, by adulting uh, and, and being shaped by society to start like paying bills and get a job where you clock I in. I got, I got to tell you from my perspective as somebody in his 60s, <laughs> um, the, yeah, there is a lot of this. I, I'm not making this a joke that, that um, and I, I make as a question today, yeah. organizers, Union organizers, other kinds of organizers, activists, activists for racial justice, um, burn out. They do. They have mm -hmm. uh, you know periods of their lives that they give to this, and then they just have to go recharge their batteries. Right. And so I'm not sure that we can place our hope in people giving all of their lives all of the time enduringly. Some of the hope has to be where you put it with memory. What is going to keep inspiring new waves of people to but, join up? But, here, but here's the thing, though. But this is where it comes back to what you what you pointed to, is that we have to have a creative imagination, right, of yep. how we do this. Yep. Like, what then does it look like to say, let me take who I am, my job, my skill sets, my work, and bend it towards justice, <laughs> right? on an everyday basis. And so I'm constantly challenging the systems in which I live. And I see this is where George Floyd gets it right. George Floyd Square, sorry. George Floyd Square gets it right. Is that the, the anchoring of the protest comes from residents, uh -huh. comes from homeowners, mm -hmm. comes from neighbors. It's not a kind of occupation where people right. pitch their tents and said, I dare you to move me. Literally, it was like, all right, city, come if you will. We're just going to go home, wash off whatever chemicals you put on us, and come right back out the next day because we live here. Yeah. And so we have a kind of, we have skin in the game that, that someone who's just pitching a tent doesn't because I, 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 I was talking to one of my neighbors the other day, and I said, you know, it's so funny. People remember the Minneapolis uprising of 2020 
But what other folks don't know or understand is our memories of getting our hoses as our weapons to protect our communities from burning down, right? Using, literally using water as our weapon to protect our communities from burning down. Like that was a kind of like, everything is at risk, but we believe in this justice. And so we organize as a block to say, all right, we're not gonna call the police if something goes down but this is how we are going to respond as a community and so when you get people organizing on a level of just bringing who you are to the table and saying we're going to keep us safe we are going to get us equitable wages we are going to fight for each other what like who are you what's your background what's your concern and how can i how can i leverage what i have um to help you get the justice that you need and I think if we start with that kind of creative imagination of not saying that you have to be a community organizer, we weren't community organizers at George Floyd Square. We were teachers and uh, cooks and um, uh, one person was a fashion design student, another person was a, a contractor and a builder by trade. Mm -hmm. But people bringing their skill sets to say, okay, how can we lean in to support each other? Mm -hmm. And this is, this is our hope. We are our hope we keep us safe, we will get that justice. So on a labor organizing level, what does that look like in the same way to say, you have your job security, but can you care about mine? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the great things um, I'd say of some of the work that um, UHW w has led is that it is precisely that, right? So part of what Dave was telling us about is 100,000 workers devoting some of their resources to try to secure benefits for millions, right? Not just for themselves. And that's love. And that's what you're talking about. That's right. love, right? Love. That's love. And, that's love and justice. And transformation, right? Because that's saying that we can't just do this in our small community. We have to do it in a larger transformation. Right. And, and, and it, I think it's a, I appreciate that point, Craig. And part of what, you know, again, we think about, we, we think about scale and we think about, you know, we're an organization of 100,000 folks and with a little bit of creativity and a little bit of resources, you know, we were able to figure out a way and I, I'd like, you know, that it is about love. It's, it's saying to people that people like us don't win enough. We have to win more. We have to learn how to win. We have to expect to win. Um, and I, I get enormous hope that, you know, that an organization of 100,000 folks can figure out how to secure real improvements for over 17 million people. By the way, it bears noting 17 million people is more people than the aggregate union membership in yeah. America. That, that is literally true. And so, you know, I think again, it, there are reasons to be optimistic and people do have an innate sense of, you know, solidarity. People want to see people like themselves win. And it's not just young people, it's old and tired people like us too. And, you know, and, and members of our union who are in their fifties and sixties, and they want to see people win. So I really do think, you know, that, that I've never been disappointed when you appeal to the best in people. But you got you got to be able to you know it's it's not just about appeals. It takes resources. It takes a plan. It takes a concrete sense of how to get there, and people will do an enormous amount if it seems like there's a chance, right? But people get demoralized if it seems like we're just tilting at windmills. That's what happens in Bessemer with Amazon. Yeah. They can't see that they can beat Amazon. It doesn't make any sense. And it's up to people who want to do this work like we do. We got to identify places and locations and opportunities where it's not tilting at windmills. It's not running into machine gun fire. You can really win. And, and when you appeal to the best in people, I have never, I've never seen people not respond if, if we're doing our job. So you're pointing at an important thing, which is optimism with good reasons behind it. 
and being able to show those good reasons, not just saying, hey, you got to be optimistic. So that makes sense to me. Let me pull one last thought from the accounts of the square um, and, and pose it as a question to Dave, though, because I think something very important about the square is, and, and you were just stressing it, Janelle, is the sense of community, right? Not just that people were actors on behalf of a community or for a community, they were a community. So one of the greatest um, achievements of the square was mobilizing a local community and it shaped lots that you did, right? I mean, that all of the different demands had to be there because somebody thought each one of those was crucial, right? So the community was important. The place was also important. You were commemorating a place um, at that intersection, right? Um, and place-based community tends to get devalued often in lots of American society and decision-making, and we can go to how Walmart locates stores and what happens or any of the whole variety of different um, examples. What I want to take back to Dave is by choosing a strategy that bets heavily on democracy, um, you're pursuing a strategy that also has a pretty strong place emphasis, right? So the organizing is going to need to be by state or by municipality or with a strong place um, sense of solidarity. Is that fair? No, I think it's it's absolutely fair. And, you know, and just the reality of our organization is, you know, we're in the largest state in the country, 40 million people in California. It's this enormous place. And frankly, when you look at a state like Arizona, it seems, you know, Arizona's got two thirds the number of people of LA County. <laughs> you know, it seems uh, like- Now you're gonna them. hurt our feelings. Uh, <laughs> but they're wonderful. They're much better looking than the people in LA County. <laughs> but like what's amazing about it, and, and I think that's what we've learned is, you know, it, it is about place. We do think about it fundamentally at that level is what can you build in a given state like Arizona, like Utah, like Idaho, Montana, New Mexico, places we're looking at. And, you know, it's actually encouraging that, it, you know, I, I'm, I'm a total optimist that it can be done and you can build organizations with real depth, real community. We think we're doing that right now with Healthcare Rising Arizona. Um, and it, you know, and it is a place-based thing and it, ge you know, geography does matter in this thing that, that we're looking at. So I think that's an accurate observation. All right. I think it's an accurate observation that if we talk anymore, we are just postponing the reception, <laughs> but I want to close out by commending Michael McQuarrie for the work that the center of partly by building community among the people in the center. Mike, thank you. Thank you, Fred. Um, thank all of you for being here. Uh, I've enjoyed it this afternoon. Um, I'm sorry that we went a bit over on time and we didn't get to have as much conversation as I would have liked. Um, but we do have a reception now. We have some drinks and we have a little bit of food right now. Um, but I also want to note that um, uh, we are going to have drinks and dinner at my house after this conference, and I'm going to put the address on there so that anybody who's here is welcome to join us. Um, and I hope that we can continue the conversation over uh, uh, a drink right now um, and then um, at my house for dinner. Um, so uh, please try and make it to those if you can. Um, it should be an interesting conversation this evening. So thank you all very much for being here. Um, and uh, I hope that we can gather again soon. I'm sorry, Mary Mark, No, I was there? waving at Dave. I forgot. <laughs> he was waving at us. Thanks, Dave. Okay. I did want to say something, though, while Dave is still here. Can yeah. I say it? Go ahead. Okay, this speaks to the optimism. Um, I, I know of a political scientist who studied, he compared the voting record of every single representative in Congress against the political uh, survey of the actual constituents and the constituents were so much more in favor of fairness and all of these better living standards and pay and the vote and the representative was voting in the totally different area so there's a foundation in the population for these more more progressive ideas i i, I don't i think that's the basis for optimism 
Pessimism of the mind, optimism of the spirit, right, Mary Margaret? Yep. Okay. What was I'm sorry. <laughs>